Hi, I'm Noah Gervais. In this video, we're going to be doing a whole franchise retrospective of the Mass Effect trilogy. We're going to be looking at the three base games, all of their DLC, and how they develop throughout time in terms of character, plot, and design. It's going to take us a long time. It's going to take us about two and a half hours. So everything is broken down in the table of contents in the video description by timestamp. You can break it up and go to whatever thing you're interested in, or you can watch the video all at once. It's your choice, but it's a lot of content. So let's get rolling with it. The Mass Effect trilogy is one of the most beloved and memorable yeah, science fiction series of this generation. Its popularity and creativity rival almost any other science fiction universe seen in print or on television. Please reconstruct Yet Mass Effect is a bit of a pop culture chimera, constantly scavenging presentation techniques and narrative themes from other media, like the kind of narrative space opera you'd find in Peter F. Hamilton's novels, or imitations of the kind of camera work and presentation techniques you'd see in contemporary television, like the new Battlestar Galactica or Game of Thrones. Mass Effect even draws heavily from the pace formatting and party composition of Bioware's breakout Xbox hit, Knights of the Old Republic. So what makes it so worthwhile? It's because the writers, programmers, and artists that worked on the game took an incredible amount of care to stitch those elements together in a way that's truly their own, new and exciting even in its repurposing of decades of disparate sci-fi elements, and because of how successful Bioware was in expressing those elements in the unique format of video games. Mass Effect games change a great deal from title to title, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But with each iteration, Bioware tried to express the universe a little differently, tackle it from a different angle. This also gives Mass Effect a lot of distinctiveness among other sci-fi games because of how much it draws from a truly diverse background of sci-fi media and how interested it is in replicating the feel of science fiction before video games broke free from the arcade. The traditional sci-fi aesthetic is pervasive, from little technical details like how Mass Effect is one of the first video games to give an option to apply a film grain to the screen for a deliberately VHS-era sci-fi flavor, to thematic composition like its freewheeling blend of violence and sex and comedy and flavors of whole other genres like noir. Mass Effect possesses an anything-goes feel that has tremendous resonance with the paperback sci-fi of the 70s and 80s. Ask any fan what the biggest reason they love the Mass Effect series is, though, and they'll say without hesitation that it's the characters. What's truly unique about the Mass Effect experience, even among other Bioware titles, is how it follows its character arcs over an incredibly long period of time, across three very long games, and lets the player truly walk that journey with those characters, shaping the nature of the protagonist's world and the protagonist's relationship with others, a narrative experience only possible through the remarkable hybrid format of video games. Commander Shepard, the player's character, is an amazing tool for the player to interact with the game, not because of how deep the role-playing experience is, but because of how much more part of the game world Commander Shepard is than a completely player-invented character, like in a D&D-influenced game such as Neverwinter Nights. Rather than choose an entire line of dialogue from a long list, a Bioware tradition since the dawn of PC gaming, a player would choose a word or phrase to indicate how to steer the conversation from Little Wheel, and Shepard would speak on the chosen topic and or with the chosen attitude. Traditional Western RPG player characters are meant to be direct representations of the player in the game world. The player should have as much creative control over them as possible. So, if you don't voice the player character, the player himself feel, fills it in with how they imagine the PC to sound like. Shepard is completely different. Shepard is the main character in the game world first, and the player's custom creation second. Playing Mass Effect, the relationship between the player and his or her character is as third person as the gameplay is. We the players direct our shepherds, look over their shoulders, inform their moral choices, plan their itinerary, but we never assume complete ownership of the experience. The question is always, how will it turn out for Shepard, and not, how will it turn out for me? Not only does this encourage multiple playthroughs from different perspectives, it deepens the player's experience of the game's supporting cast. It's a known conceit of RPGs that it's hard to portray a dynamic, realistic relationship in the short time frame of the game, that you're only ever a few missions away from being best buddies with your crew. But having Shepard develop as a character along the same arc and within the same time frame as his crew makes it seem like much less of a silly thing, hides the gamey parts of the narrative by letting the demands of the story trump the player's desire for control over their character. It's one of the principal complaints about the series, that the player's role-playing experience is too streamlined through Shepard's limited but fully voiced and acted choices. 
But this approach to the player's character is the backbone of the entire trilogy, and, in my opinion, its greatest strength. When the first game was originally released in 2007, it was a revolutionary approach to role-playing in a video game. But in terms of pacing and the construction of the narrative, the first Mass Effect did not take that many risks. It's pretty much got the exact skeletal structure of Knights of the Old Republic, except with a brand new proprietary universe to set up for the player and all the exposition that goes along with it. Knights of the Old Republic was for the original Xbox what Mass Effect was for the 360, so it makes sense that they would be pretty similar. Both are titles that leverage traditional computer RPG storytelling to elevate a console-focused gameplay experience. I play both on the PC, but the Xbox focus is pervasive. Mass Effect's dialogue wheel, for example, is an idea born with thumbsticks in mind. Both games share the same pacing, also. The Citadel and Tannis both serve as an introduction to the galaxy before sending you off to four any-order plot planets, and finally a surprise climax planet topped by an epic battle surrounding a space station. However, Mass Effect is a game that's much broader in scope. Not only does it provide you with dozens of planetary side missions to complete on top of the main plot missions, it spends most of its energy introducing players to the vibrant and creative dynamics of the universe it's created. Cordo did this too, of course, but there it was more a matter of repackaging the tropes of Star Wars in a way that feels fresh, as opposed to having the opportunity as a game developer to explore whatever themes you want from the perspectives that you choose. As such, the first Mass Effect is way, way more expository than its successors. Shepard spends a hell of a lot of time having things explained to him, and some people count that against the first game, but a little less conversation and a little more action would have made it more engaging. But I think the constant knowledge bombing is a major part of the charm of the first game. Shepard's a newcomer to galactic politics, just like the player, and while each Shepard has a background of distinction, chosen from three backgrounds during character creation, Shepard is still an Alliance space yokel, and people treat him that way. The universe of Mass Effect treats all humans that way for the most part, actually, which is a genius bit of world building. Here in the first game, all of humanity is a newcomer to spacefaring society, and they're seen as too ambitious, too demanding, and having been given too much power already. So, in the early game, where Shepard is being considered for acceptance into the Spectres, the problem-solving branch of the Citadel's Council, not only is it a great narrative placement for the protagonist to begin understanding the world of Mass Effect, it gives a lot of weight and momentum to Shepard's, well, role. As the first human specter, what you do is representative of the attitude humanity will have towards the galaxy, and your unique position allows you to make decisions that politically shape the galaxy according to Shepard's attitude, renegade or paragon. The renegade attitude, red on the dialogue wheel, is notable because it's not an evil alignment exactly. A renegade will do whatever it takes to get the job done, damn the cost and fuck your mercy. A renegade is cruel. But a renegade is never wholly unjustified, either. That makes the experience so much more engaging than, say, just making evil choices in a Neverwinter Nights game, where you're principally being cruel out of spite. Here in Mass Effect, what you're doing is making brutal decisions to win a fight with the odds stacked sky-high against you. Wouldn't you do whatever it takes to win? Wouldn't Shepard? The Paragon is, naturally, the flip side, blue on the wheel, and centered around compassion and the spirit of cooperation. A Paragon Shepherd is a warrior diplomat, always trying to see the different sides of an issue and be inclusive. Playing Paragon is a little less exciting than playing Renegade, especially in later titles when conversation interrupts are introduced, but it's an incredibly rewarding experience from a role-playing perspective. A Paragon Shepherd shows the galaxy humanity's most noble aspects, and has slightly deeper friendships with the Normandy's crew than a Renegade Shepherd, who doesn't like people forgetting who's the damn commander around these parts. The way the player interacts with the crew is a little different here than in later titles as well. A little stiffer, a little more formal. Because of the game's need to establish this entire new universe of themes, races, and competing cultural values, each crew member is kind of an ambassador for their society, trading viewpoints and anecdotes with each other on the long elevator rides that punctuate the first game. Tally, Liara, Garrus, and Rex are the engines of exposition that introduce Shepard to the cultures and plot lines the series will spend three games exploring. Tally introduces us to the Quarians and the Geth, establishing the danger of synthetic life and the fragility of organic life once they've constructed their betters, as well as smaller details like the Quarian Admiralty Board, which will slowly expand in importance as the series goes on. Knowing the climax of the third game, the conflict between synthetic and organic life, which was always an important subplot in the series, takes on new and special significance. The Quarians and the Geth have a fascinating dynamic. The Geth, a race of synthetics who grow smarter in groups as more processes are able to work in concert, rebelled against their creators but did not kill them, will destroy any who come near their space but, until now anyway, will not move beyond it. 
Theirs is a fascinating technological hermit kingdom, and there's hints throughout the game that the Geth have some kind of religion and may have a deeper culture than you'd expect just by being shot at by them. Geth begin as a boogeyman, and then the series slowly layers in details that make you wonder if they're really deserving of annihilation or not. After the Geth qu kicked the Quarians off their homeworld, thus creating their wandering migrant fleet, the Council outlawed any true artificial intelligence. With good reason, it seems. Nearly every interaction Shepard has with an AI in the first game is negative. Take this obscure side quest, where Shepard encounters an AI, originally designed to cheat at gambling terminals, hiding in a Citadel server. Upon discovery, it attempts to take the money and run, threatening to blow itself and Shepard sky-high using an improvised explosive it had installed on itself. AIs will fight for their lives like any other sentient thing. Is conflict between organics and their superior creations truly inevitable? Garrus shows us the frustrations of life in the alien bureaucracy, the rigidity of Turian society, and the struggles faced by a good Turian trying to do right in the face of a galaxy that doesn't care. Garrus's themes, as they develop throughout the series, are more personal than other characters. Garrus is a mirror for Shepard, how far Shepard is willing to go for justice, how high a price Shepard will place on an individual life. Garrus is a very different Turian, depending on who Shepard decides to be, and it starts here in the first game with his decision to leave CSEC, and how Shepard chooses to handle Dr. Salian, the fugitive doctor Garrus has been hunting for years. Liara also changes a great deal from game to game, but with less input from the player. When she's introduced, she's a naive academic, caught up in events beyond her ability to control or a skill to deal with. As time moves on, and the stakes facing the Normandy's original crew grow higher, she becomes so much more and really steps up to the challenge. But in the first game, she's just a girl, really, and her naivety and shyness make her a fun way to introduce the players to the Asari. Now, the Asari are an all-female, all-attractive race of ladies whose personalities always seem to be reflected in their skin color and the way they wear their head tentacles. Yeah, it's cheesy. But using sci-fi to explore sexual themes as much as scientific or philosophical themes is a long-running tradition. It's difficult to go a hundred pages in classic sci-fi, even or especially with classic authors like Robert Heinlein or Jerry Purnell, without someone getting down, and more often than not, getting it down really weird. It's part of the fun of sci-fi, using aliens and alien cultures to portray a sexual perspective not possible in, you know, reality, like a race of pansexual thousand-year-old blue women with a penchant for both precision warfare and table dancing. Since Liara is written as a pretty meek character in the first game, she frames the Asari's culture of sexuality and artistic curation in a slightly apologetic way, then mellows out the more ridiculous aspects of her society. Liara is also one of the game's romanceable characters for either male or female shepherds, which had an interesting impact on how people ended up playing the game. Mostly, people tend to play the characters of their own gender, with notable minorities of players choosing the opposite. Mass Effect has a demonstrably larger and more vocal group of players who switch genders while playing compared with other role-playing franchises. There's a couple reasons why a lady shepherd, called Femshep, is such a popular style of playthrough among straight men, the first being the third-person relationship between the player and Shepard. Male players don't feel like they're playing as a woman, they're interested to see Shepard's experience as a woman character. The second being Jennifer Hale's spectacular voice acting job across all three titles, and the third being Liara. Why would I play as a woman and experience the narrative without an analog from my sexual perspective? The straight male player asks, maybe not in so many words. And the game replies with, suppose we included an adorable lesbian romance with this blue chick. To which considerably more players than would otherwise do so said, you know what? Sold. Is that a tacky reason to play Femship? Well, sure. Is it part of the foundation of Mass Effect's popularity? Absolutely. And by and large, people who experience the game as Femship enjoy it for a multitude of reasons, not just der her her reasons. But for a lot of players, Liara's romantic subplot was a major influence in choosing to play Femship in the first place. Arguably the most impressive plot arc from the original crew is Rex's. Initially, Rex seems just like a newer, larger version of Kandorus Ordo from Knights of the Old Republic, but as the series goes on, he becomes not only an extremely charismatic focal point of the overarching plot, but sees fulfilled, or attempts to fulfill, depending on Shepard in the third game, a cultural rebirth of his entire species, with which Rex is very much disenfranchised here in the first game. He's bitter, angry with his people for being so short-sighted and directionless. He's an aging mercenary, good only for killing the things he's paid to kill, or so Rex feels, as most Krogan feel. 
Rex's story is a story of a natural leader coming to understand the depth of leadership. Fascinating to see up close as it unfolds across all the games. What's interesting about Mass Effect as a role-playing game, though, as opposed to a straightforward presentation like books or movies, is that Rex might be almost completely absent from your overall Mass Effect experience. About two-thirds through the first game, when you reach the planet Vermeer, Shepard is compelled to destroy a potential cure for the artificial sterility problem that have kept the Krogan down for centuries, the Genophage, and Rex quite naturally has a major problem with that. You can talk with him about it and inspire him to find an alternative path to Krogan resurgence that will occupy him for the entire rest of the trilogy, or, alternatively, you can blow his brains out right there all over the white bright sand of the Vermeer beach and end the entire plot arc right there. The best designed aspects of Mass Effect's plot are the modular ones, the ones that seamlessly swap in or out depending on player choice, and Rex represents the most famous among them. Even your human crewmates, Caden and Ashley, act as ambassadors of their culture, balancing the perspectives of your alien crewmates with some good old-fashioned human nationalism. Planetism? Ashley in particular is a controversial character because she starts the game out outspokenly racist against aliens. A bit of a bold move, albeit one many players disliked. But Ashley's racism serves a lot of purposes in the narratives and the balance of characters. Firstly, some level of suspicious Earth-first mentality would be an inescapable reality for humanity in any multicultural sci-fi scenario. It's part of what we as humans have to overcome. And Ashley does overcome it through her talks with Shepard and her first-hand experiences on the Normandy. This is so much more rewarding than a pat, in the future, all humans are open-minded approach, a la Gene Roddenberry's original vision for Star Trek. So to see Ashley actually struggling with the issue across the first game is one of, I think, its tightest written character arcs. She doesn't have to get over it, either. Shepard's renegade path is militantly pro-Earth, and Shepard and Ashley can be bigots together, as later in the game they let the Citadel Council die. Either way, Shepard's choices are reflected in Ashley's character arc. Caden, on the other hand, is aggressively boring. He has the least personality of any crewmate, and serves only to establish the struggles of human biotics, a recurring theme in the series. Or to serve as a love interest for Lady Shepard a Lady Shepherd who's willing to settle. The first game's plot is also the tightest written, has the sharpest focus, and takes the least amount of time to complete out of the trilogy. It's really just a small handful of plot planets, a galactic hub, and your crew. How then to draw out the experience and make the character arcs feel like they're playing out over a long enough amount of time? The first game chooses planetary exploration as its answer, and man was it ever a good choice. Exploring the dozens of side missions scattered throughout the barren but large planets is one of the single most iconic elements of the first game compared to the rest of the series. From the incredibly sluggish, janky controls of the Mako, your tank-slash-buggy-slash-1994 Buick Roadmaster, to the actually quite beautiful art direction encountered on the dozens of distinct planets, the ability to scoot around these exotic worlds and solve minor crises went a long way towards making the player feel like they're really a space captain, not just a soldier following orders. The threat from Saren, the game's mostly on-scene antagonist, is nebulous and vague. You're not sure what he's up to out there, nothing good, obviously, but there's enough slack in the narrative to accommodate Shepard's decision to gallivant around landing on all of these worlds. Unfortunately, while the looks of the environments, the skies, the weathers, and the rocks are, for the most part, wonderfully distinctive, there's a lot that gets reused during, during these segments. The indoor environments, underground bunker, above ground bunker, and mineshaft, get reused constantly. I'm totally serious about there only being three. All they do is move crates around. The activities you do on every planet is also identical. Driving the Mako up mountainsides while occasionally solving hacking minigames and firing your cannon. It's apparent that these planets were made on the cheap, saving the big money game production for the main plot, but for every moment where you shotgun through the same uninspired room full of crates, you'll have a moment where you descend into a gorgeous alien valley at sunset with the crumbling obelisk of an ancient culture standing defiant against the endless sky. One of the moments that make Commander Shepard's journey so worthwhile. The first Mass Effect's most successful piece of downloadable content, Bring Down the Sky, is essentially a particularly long planetary side mission. Bring Down the Sky was made right at the very beginning of when DLC was emerging as widespread game and business strategy, so it feels a little slight when you compare it to the incredible high-budget DLC of the next couple games. But it is a fascinating little nugget of early DLC that actually has a lot of impact on the trilogy's overall plot. It mostly serves to introduce the Batarians, a poor race of slavers and extremists featured heavily in later games but absent from the stock Mass Effect 1 experience. 
A Batarian named Balak has hijacked an asteroid fitted with thrusters for mining and plans to slam it into a human-occupied world in reprisal for humanity's aggressive expansion into what had been previously thought of as Batarian space. It's really well done, if a bit drawn out, and expands on the common galactic sentiment that humans ask for too much, pay for too little. And it sets up a fascinating personal conflict for Shepard when he finds himself in shoes quite similar to Balak's in the Mass Effect 2 DLC, The Arrival, as well as in Mass Effect 3, where Balak shows up again, supposing you let him live here in the first game. Bring Down the Sky illustrates quite well how truly amazing the side missions of the first game could have been if they'd simply had more time and money to put into them. Mass Effect 1 has another piece of DLC, a series of combat trials called Pinnacle Station, but it was not available for standalone purchase at the time of this video's production, so I'm not able to comment on it. One of my favorite moments from the first game is also one of its most visually unimpressive, and it's hidden here among the side missions. Very early on, before you even get to Normandy, you'll meet Nasari who calls herself the Consort, and if you do her a favor, she'll do you one. She'll give you a cryptic hint about Shepard's ultimate fate, and give you a small Prothean trinket with no known use. Much, much later, atop a hidden plateau on a faraway world, you'll come across an enigmatic floating sphere with a slot at its base. When you insert the trinket, you're shown, via pop-up text, a vision of early humanity, still hunter-gatherers under the watchful eye of the Prothean civilization. Knowing from so early on that humans are an intractable part of the cycle of, of uplift and downfall that shapes the primary plot of Mass Effect, knowing that the mysterious Protheans were there from the start, that humans and Asari and Turians and Hanar alike owe their current success to the meddling of ancient conquerors, gives the fight against the Reapers a real depth. The Protheans' meddling in human development doesn't come up again until the third game, and even then you don't learn anything that this sphere and a bunch of pop-up text hasn't already taught you. It's amazing just how much of the deep back history of the Mass Effect universe is hidden in the background of the game, not only on side planets, but on the star map, on planets you can't even land on. Every planet in the systems you can visit has a description of the star map, and collectible item quests compel players to look at each one, and there are devils in the details. There is setup for Mass Effect 3's Leviathan DLC, as well as what happens to the Batarians in the third game, and the planet description for Dis. You can also find a thousand-mile-long scar of an ancient planetary siege weapon, a weapon that destroyed the derelict reaper you visit in Mass Effect 2. And everywhere are the ruins of civilizations built atop the ruins of other civilizations. You don't need Liara to tell you that the galaxy is built upon cycles of extinction. The star map will tell you, and tell you even more than spoken dialogue does, if you take the time to listen. It's a touch of old Bioware design values, from back in the Baldur's Gate era, where half the fun of finding treasure was to read the item descriptions. Alright, so far we've talked about the plot without really talking about the plot, so let's get into it. The first Mass Effect is pretty much hands down the best plotted and paced of the trilogy, and it starts small, a glimpse of a bizarre and unknown warship heading an assault on the famous human colony of Eden Prime. Commander Shepard, in trying to foil the attack, comes into contact with a Prothean beacon, a part of a tens of thousands of year old communication network. The beacon sears a warning into Shepard's mind. Something terrible has consumed the Prothean Empire, a horror from beyond the stars that brings only death and silence. The Lovecraftian influence is pretty obvious here, but Mass Effect really makes the cliché their own. For the, first, for the first two thirds of the game, Shepard is tracing Saren, a fellow Spectre who's turned coat and begun working as an agent for the mystery ship seen in the opening. Saren's backstory is actually extremely well fleshed out, but not in the game. There's a paperback novel called Revelation by the game's lead writers that goes into it at length, but if you're going in blind, Saren is a very enigmatic background villain, his trail always cold by the time you snip it out. Liara, when she joins your crew, hypothesizes that the mystery ship is a Reaper, one of a race of sentient machines that, according to Deep Legend, killed the Protheans so many thousands of years ago. Then, on the planet Vermeer, in Saren's own office, the ship finally speaks to Shepard, and it is one of the best moments in the entire trilogy. Rudimentary creatures of blood and flesh, you touch my mind, fumbling in ignorance, incapable of understanding. I don't think this is a VI. There is a realm of existence so far beyond your own, you cannot even imagine it. I am beyond your comprehension. I am sovereign. This scene was flawless in 2007, from the amount of exposition, to the audio editing, to the dramatic weight of the revelation, just a goddamn great moment in science fiction. The ship's name is Sovereign, and it is itself a nation collective of innumerable programs and processes all working in concert with singular will. 
and that will decrees that all advanced organic life in the galaxy is to be harvested and, as we'll learn later, archived in the form of a reaper, and the time of the harvest is nigh. The scene completely nails the sense of malicious aloofness a being like this might have, as well as the impression that it's only willing to explain itself because it takes literally no effort for it to do so, and all humanity will die soon enough anyway. You see, the whole galaxy has been played by the Reapers from the beginning of their interstellar empires. The entire mass relay system, by which almost all interstellar travel functions, was designed by the Reapers so that, every few hundred thousand years when civilizations peak, they can exploit the relays and begin their harvest anew. The key to it is the Citadel, which each cycle populates before the harvest, and the Enigmatic Keepers, a strange race of insect-like creatures that have maintained the Citadel since the beginning of the current galactic era and the one before that, and the one before that, and so on. The Keepers seem harmless, and much is made of their goofy appearance and seeming timelessness earlier in the game. When you know the truth, it's quite macabre. The Keepers are a millions of years old slave race of janitors, mopping up the remains of countless cycles of civilizations off the floor of the Citadel until no trace of blood remains, and then waiting patiently for the new owners to show up. Later, by tracking down a hidden Prothean facility that escaped the Reaper's harvest, Shepard encounters a Prothean virtual intelligence called Vigil. In this incredibly memorable conversation, Vigil tells the story of how the Protheans sleeping in the stasis pods lining the canyon-like walls of the facility were powered down, one by one, until by the time the Reapers had finally left, only a handful remained. These survivors found a way to interfere with the Keepers, forcing Sovereign to interact directly with the Citadel in this cycle to send the signal that would begin the harvest, a signal that would use the Citadel itself as a relay to bring all the other Reapers out of hiding from beyond the edge of the galaxy and directly into the heart of populated space. It's what happened to the Protheans. The Citadel fell within minutes, and even if the rest of their civilization would take hundreds of years to harvest, they had lost before they even began. The first game is commendable for having a climax that's both a satisfying conclusion and a cliffhanger, a balance that is exceedingly hard to strike. The first game's final portion sees Shepard using the Conduit, a backdoor relay that leads directly to the Citadel, to catch up to Saren and stop Sovereign from triggering the extinction of all advanced organic life. The stakes are high, but almost all of the lingering concerns of the game get addressed in this last half hour or so. The fight up the side of the Council Tower towards Sovereign, interspersed with cutscenes depicting the battle raging overhead, pitting a human alliance and Citadel Council fleets against the overwhelming power of just one Reaper. Once you reach the Council Chambers, fighting through the atrium where you were first named Spectre, you get this great confrontation with Saren. Back on Vermeer, you fought Saren briefly, and it ended in an exchange where Saren started to express doubt about his own free will. It had always been his intention to try to save at least some organic life by appeasing the Reapers, but the Reapers have a power of indoctrination. Slowly, but completely, those in the direct presence of Reapers fall under their sway. The stronger the control, the less functional the thrall is. Saren figured that, since he can still think and act rationally, he was not being controlled. Through conversation with Shepard, Saren realizes he's been duped. There's no telling if his mind is even his own anymore, no excuse for helping the Reapers, when it's apparent that even the Reaper's greatest servant is nothing better to them than a slave. It makes him incredibly sympathetic in these moments, and in reviewing Saren's actions throughout the game, the player can see his logic in it. Saren makes sense. His plan makes sense. But he chose the side that would betray him just as surely as he had betrayed so many others. So he kills himself. No boss fight, just a sad realization, a bullet, and then a galaxy-altering choice. Shepard must choose whether to risk human fleets by sending them to protect the Citadel Council aboard their flagship, the Destiny Ascension. If Shepard lets them die, it leaves humanity in the strongest position it's ever had in the galaxy. It's a hell of a choice. Once you make it, well, the game was just kidding about no boss fight. Now you fight the cybernetic corpse of Saren for a bit while a plot happens in the background. The boss fight might come off as a bit shallow after how well they handled Saren's suicide, but events need more time to play out, and the boss fight is probably the simplest, highest tension way to throw in one last gameplay segment while allowing events in progress to happen. Afterwards, there's a quick Did Shepard Die moment, followed by an epilogue conversation where you, chi where you either choose who, between Anderson and Counselor Udina, becomes humanity's representative on the Council if you save them, or decide who will chair the human-led Council now that humans are in a position to seize the throne, so to speak, if you didn't. 
This climax has huge payoffs in all the areas that count. The level design for the last segment is novel, exciting, fast-paced, and challenging. The antagonists are thoroughly and excitingly defeated, and the attitudes that Shepard has expressed throughout the entire game manifest themselves galaxy-wide, either through championing humans as a member of a galactic partnership, or destroying the obstacles that stand in the way of human ascendancy. The threat of the Reaper is still lurking beyond the edges of the galaxy, still looms, and looms large, but not large enough to overshadow the feeling of accomplishment that comes from wrapping up the first game's plot. It's a tidiness of scripting that the series never quite comes back around to. The first Mass Effect was a pivotal release in video game history. It's when the old style of Bi Bioware RPG, all dialogue and inventory screens, started becoming the new, with a huge emphasis on the visual and the visceral. Its triumphs are built on the successes of both its modernizing features and its roots. By the time Mass Effect 2 was released, Bioware was ready to throw most of its traditional design elements out the window and try something different from anything they'd ever made before. The Shepherd of the first game just wouldn't work for the second. Everything was to be refocused, all the mechanics were vamped. The galaxy was a too raw stage right after Sovereign's defeat to just keep playing. It needed time to settle down into a new routine. Bioware needed a way to zero Shepard out, have him start at the bottom again instead of the top, take away his abilities so they can reconfigure the mechanics of them, take away his crew so that you can meet them anew. The Shepard players had spent so many hours crafting in the first game was an obstacle to the overwhelming amount of change that the second game would bring. That Shepard wouldn't do. He would have to die. So he does, in the opening five minutes, where a new mystery ship shows up from nowhere and overpowers the Normandy in seconds. Flames rage as the ship disintegrates around you. You save some crew, whoever your love interest was from the first game, and Joker, but Shepard doesn't make it. As the opening titles begin, Shepard suffocates in the impossible cold of space. This accomplishes everything that Bioware needs to reset the Mass Effect experience for the player. As the game credits roll on, Commander Shepard is brought back from the dead by science magic, the six billion dollar spaceman. And so you get to reconstruct his face and choose a new class if you like. As for storytelling, it's a bit cheap, but it's incredibly functional in terms of the demands of the game itself. What does carry over is a catalog of the decisions you've made in the last game, accomplished by mining your old save game's data, which swaps in and out different characters and plot events depending on what you chose in the first game. The promise of this feature was mind-blowing, something RPG players had always wanted but never received before. The execution was decidedly less impressive than the promise. Most of these details are sidelined in this game, so that your consequences only really appear on the periphery of your Mass Effect 2 experience. There's still a ton of fun connections between this game and the first, and some big-ticket changes like Rex being alive or not, but the ramifications of your choices in the first game are not as deeply felt as a player might want them to be. Another reason Shepard had to die, had to be made relatively powerless again, is that you'll be spending the entire game working for Cerberus, a shadow organization of Earth-first interests who tried to get their mitts on pretty much every evil, awful thing you found out there in the galaxy back in Mass Effect 1. They're a minor background villain in the first game, and a slightly cliché and cartoonish one at that. Now, they're called upon to be a much more dynamic element in the narrative, and it sort of works. It's extremely ham-fisted, but it sort of works. Mass Effect 2 is scripted and paced completely differently than the first game. This game is principally a series of vignettes in the Mass Effect universe that serve to flesh out the player's experience of the game world by demonstration rather than exposition. We see the themes that were discussed in the last game in an intellectual, airy way writ large over specific characters and situations. Put it another way, Mass Effect 1 is designed like a movie with a direct arc and tight focus, and Mass Effect 2 is like a television serial. A little plot here, a little monster of the week there, a larger cast with less, spend, with less time spent individually with them, all leading up to a season finale that ties it all together. Also, like the season of a television show, Mass Effect 2 doesn't satisfactorily wrap up the majority of its plot twists, just advances them while moving towards the next season, Mass Effect 3. The Reapers don't happen this season, but the Reapers are the main driver of the plot. How do you get the player to consent to ignoring the Reapers for a spell while events develop? Having Shepard die and be brought back by Cerberus takes away the need for the player's consent. The player asks, why would Shepard play Cerberus at their own crooked game? And Shepard replies, it's the only game in town. The Alliance has moved on. The Council won't listen about the Reapers. They've ignored everything Shepard's told them and gone back to business as usual. But human colonies are disappearing, and Cerberus has the ship, the money, and the will to look into it. 
They don't even have to ask Shepard pretty please. He's working for them now. It's the most functional choice for the style of pacing and delivery they've chosen for Mass Effect 2, but in a series built on choice, it's a little jarring to have such an important one taken from you. But it's not like I can't relate. The first time I ever tried to dungeon master a round of Dungeons and Dragons, my players refused to speak with the quest giver in the first five minutes. Come on, I asked him man to man. I didn't write anything else. Just talk to the fucking guy. They refused. I had to pull everything completely out of my ass for the entire session and throw away hours of preparation and writing. Games do not have that option. They're incapable of improvising when players refuse to follow what's been written. So, Bioware pulls a fast one, a couple of fast ones, really, on the player in the opening hour of the game, so that they can write the rest of the game how they like, and not worry about the player refusing to work for Cerberus. Which would have led to huge differences in content between players as the game progressed. Expensive differences in content. With books, you just have to feed and water one writer to realize an artistic vision. With film media, hundreds must be paid from a wide variety of backgrounds and skills to produce a final pr product. With games, you're not only paying hundreds of people over several years, but even the least among them has to have years of technical training behind them. Budget matters in games. Budget matters more than it should. But the reality of it is that any game will only ever have what they could afford to show you, and no more. For accounting purposes, if nothing else, Shepard must work for Cerberus. Luckily, the vignettes themselves are much better than the game's backbone of working for an organization that the player would probably never choose to work for. Even if the price of the changes made to the series was the player's agency in the grand scheme of the game, many of these changes are positive, none more so than the changes made to the game's combat system. In the first game, combat was incredibly clunky. Weapons didn't use ammunition, they overheated after too much continuous use. Cover worked inconsistently, and while combat was fun, it was never a real point of engagement with the game world. Combat there was all about stat mechanics, bolstered by the myriad numbers of your extensive inventory, most of which was crap. Here in the second game, combat takes center stage. It has been completely overhauled to feel more visceral and immediate, relying on real working cover mechanics and reverting the weapons to an ammunition heatsink, as the game would have it, system. The game pokes fun at the change in a line from Conrad Werner in the third game, Shepard's number one fan, about how silly and backwards that seems from a technological standpoint. It is. The change was made for gameplay pacing. Not only does ammunition and clip capacity make for greater variation between weapons, it contributes more to the drama and pacing of a gun battle than a simple cooldown does. Having limited ammunition also forces you to use more guns and abilities, pushing players to vary their tactics in intense situations. Think back to the first game. Which assault rifle did you like the best? The one with the biggest numbers is probably your immediate response, though maybe I'm paraphrasing. How about the second game? I'll bet you got an actual opinion this time. The introduction of heavy weapons is also a really excellent change, giving you a thrilling, special effects laden, get out of dying free card when you need it in combat. Each gun in the game has a different flavor to it, but there's only a few. Inventory has been practically scrapped. You either have a thing or you haven't found it yet from a small list of a few dozen things, and the armors you pick up or buy along the way only provide minor and cosmetic changes to Shepard's defense. While the inventory from the first game was clunky, sure, it's a pretty big letdown and a serious departure from traditional role-playing game design to reduce the inventory down to almost nothing like they do. It's like setting your car on fire because you failed your smog inspection. Smartly, planetary exploration still remains a big part of the game, although it too has changed dramatically in its design and its presentation. You can see some of the different ways they considered handling planetary exploration if you have the Firewalker DLC. It's a series of side missions cut from the primary release where you pilot the Hammerhead, a hovercraft reimagining of the Mako, through a few different arcade-style scenarios. The sameness of the gameplay on planets in the first game was a huge complaint, so in Mass Effect 2, each side mission is just that, a very short, unique, on-foot mission to a tiny sliver of the planet, with a shuttle dropping you off and picking you up at the beginning and the end. Firewalker drops you off in the Hammerhead like they did in the Mako, and the levels are huge compared to a regular side mission. They're a lot of fun, too, although maybe a bit too arcadey for the cinematic flavor of the main game. But outside of here in the Overlord DLC, Bioware cut the hammerhead and tossed out the idea of massive areas to explore like the first game. Were they wrong? I loved the artistic design of the planets, but they were very boring from a gameplay perspective. These new side missions are consistently exciting from a gameplay perspective, but often feel disappointing from a narrative and explorative standpoint. 
Shepard doesn't say much during them, and they hold fewer secrets than side missions in the first game. Even at the end of Firewalker, Shepard discovers a Prothean sphere like the one I highlighted from last game, but nothing is revealed about it. It just shrinks down real tiny, so Shepard puts it in his pocket and use it as, uses it as a coffee table decoration for the rest of the game. Stay classy, Shepard. What the side missions do accomplish, much better than the original game, is that, like the main missions of Mass Effect 2, they have a fantastic sense of atmosphere and variety. The artistic quality of the levels varies somewhat. Occasionally, it's nothing more than a bland reuse of Mass Effect signature prefab architecture with a lot of shooting thrown in. But more often than not, you'll get a couple of vistas that are genuinely stunning, or a puzzle that's actually fun. Take the mission where you land on the solar co collector, high above a planet's surface, for instance. Even if it only consists of one simple puzzle and takes less than two minutes, the look of it is fantastic and very memorable. Most series fans remember exploring the wreck of the Estan Venico, the first human ship to come into contact with, and be immediately slaughtered by, the Vorcha. It's a short five-minute maze through the decaying superstructure of the freighter as it hangs precariously off the side of a cliff. It's buggy, like many of the side missions, which retain the bargain basement flavor of the first game's planets, but the sharp focus of the action and skillful use of the camera give them a real charm, even if Shepard gets stuck on objects and inside walls from time to time. Atmosphere is big, like in this later game side mission where you investigate a reaper relic that's turned the whole dig team that unearthed it into husks. These diversions, like in the first game, are a key way to make the, the player feel like a commander, discovering little mysteries and solving them one after another after another. It's a real shame that these missions don't contain more plot and dialogue. Even ones where you do make a choice, such as this instance where you can only stop one of two warheads from striking Colony, don't have any kind of lasting impact outside of a follow-up email. By far the most meaningful side discovery Shepard can make is a Prothean pyramid, long buried, with a more complete version of the Prothean warning about the Reapers from the first game. For the first time ever, we see the face of the Protheans, and discover that the Protheans and the Collectors are one and the same. You can find this pyramid long before this plot twist gets revealed in the primary com campaign, but its discovery isn't supported by the game itself. Shepard reacts as if the Collectors being the Prothean version of Husks is new news when it comes up later, no matter what the player knows. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves with this Collector business. Lastly, for the side missions, there's also a little piece of cut content available as DLC where you return to the crash site of the original Normandy. I expected it to be a bit of cheap fluff, but it didn't turn out that way. As you explore this little corner of a vast frozen wasteland, you pick your way through the windswept and darkened fragments of the ship whose safety was Shepard's responsibility. Shepard didn't survive the crash any more than the crew what stayed dead. The Shepard of the second game is darker, more haunted, just like Mass Effect 2 is so much darker and moodier in tone. The idealistic sense of wonder from the first game is buried here right next to your former crew, so to have Shepard come back, reflect, and place a small monument is unexpectedly meaningful as a small scene in the trilogy as a whole. Mass Effect 2 has an even greater emphasis on developing story through individual characters than the first game, and structures itself around that prioritization so completely that a lot of people accuse it of barely even having a plot. Well, it's got one. It's just not the game's main focus. The overall plot is primarily there to stagger and provide structure for the semi-freeform order you do the game's missions. Each of the game's twelve crew members gets two lengthy segments, one where they're introduced and a loyalty mission where you help resolve an outstanding personal issue that they have after having them on the ship for a while and talking to them for a bit. The first two characters you get, Jacob and Miranda, are Cerberus versions of Caden and Ashley right down to the personal values of the characters and what they're meant to show the player about Shepard's role as commander of the Normandy. They're not direct copies, though. Miranda is a genetically enhanced scientist slash corporate executive slash deep cover operative whose opinions and but the game spends quite a bit of time focusing on. Jacob's a former Alliance officer turned Cerberus operative on account of his desire to get around the bureaucracy and do real good. The idea behind them is to give Cerberus a likable face and provide skepticism. Miranda is all about Cerberus, how pushing the boundaries of morality is necessary to win sometimes, how scientific research is valuable no matter how you come by it, and Jacob's more ambivalent, caring more about the people he's serving with than the philosophy of his organization. The New Normandy's entire crew, actually, is full of morally upstanding young men and women. The elusive man admits in the third game what the developers figured out all along. Shepard, and hopefully the player, will come around to the idea of working for Cerberus if we just show them that there are a lot of nuanced reasons for joining a shadow organization like Cerberus. 
they don't want the player to resent Cerberus, and Shepard cares about his crew, so make the crew likable. It's a pretty ambitious strategy, but it plays out well, despite some shortcomings. Let's start with the shortest coming, Jacob. Jacob's character arc caused Mass Effect 2 to take a lot of heat, because his loyalty mission comes across as being stereotyped to his race. I don't think that the problems with Jacob's character stem from the fact that he's black, however. I think that the problems with Jacob's character stem from the fact that he's boring, and are compounded by pressure to have a black character stand out in a predominantly white game. Jacob's character exists in the narrative as a counterpart to Miranda, both are with Cerberus for the freedoms it affords them in their work, but Jacob has much more difficulty completing the ethical gymnastics than Miranda does. So, in Jacob's loyalty mission, which is beautiful from a visual design perspective and really janky from a writing perspective, we see him hunt down the distress beacon of his long-missing father's crashed ship. His father, over the past years, used the mind-numbing effects of the local food sources to kill or exile all the male crew and turn the women survivors into subjects of his own private rape kingdom slash god fantasy. It's some pretty serious stuff for a game to throw around, and to have dramatic and uncomfortable revelations about sexual abuse come sandwiched in between three-minute segments of blown-up robots with space magic feels kind of tasteless. Here's the beef, though. People feel that it's because of Jacob's race that he was given an absentee rapist father by the writers, and that the writers are pretty shitty for having done so. I can see where that criticism is coming from, but I think that if Jacob had been a white character, the mission would have been the same. It's about the abuse of blind authority and the corruptive influence of power when veiled from the gaze of others, and about Jacob's willingness to stand up to that authority and walk away. You know, like he eventually does with Cerberus. More than anything else, I think the sentiment that Jacob's characterization is stereotypical highlights Mass Effect's real problem with racial diversity, namely that there's just hardly any minority characters at all. If Jacob had just been one of many black characters, his bland masculinity and absentee father issues would just be boring and trite in the regular style, instead of coming across as racially motivated. Miranda's purpose in the narrative is also straightforward, but as part of the greater ensemble cast, she actually becomes relatively three-dimensional as time goes on. As the game opens, she's pretty obviously there to keep tabs on you for Cerberus's head honcho, the elusive man. Her deal is that only with Cerberus would she have been given the resources to do anything she needs to get a job done, with no red tape and no oversight. She brought Shepard back to life that way, after all. But she, sh she softens as the game progresses, suffering a major betrayal and getting pulled out of her professional detachment into the emotional and messy world of family matters. Miranda's father, a background villain in the games, is featured much more heavily in the later Mass Effect books, which also try a great deal to make Cerberus seem like less of a cartoon villain. With Miranda and Jacob, Shepard discovers that the missing human colonies are being taken by a mysterious and secretive race of insect-like beings called the Collectors. Cerberus needs Shepard to stop the Collectors, and the vast majority of the game, from the revelation of the Collectors on, is about building a team of specialists and mercenaries to follow the Collectors through their relay of no return and save the colonists. Every three or four new crew members you get, the elusive man contacts Shepard with a mission that advances the main plot. As a result, you spend huge swaths of time completely removed from not only this game's core plot arc, Stop the Collectors, but the whole overarching plot of Stop the Reapers as well. That isn't bad, though. It just leads to a new narrative rhythm that I actually love. There is no other Bioware title paced like Mass Effect 2, and while the Collectors are a bit of a weak villain, this game does more with its vignette structure than any other Mass Effect title to establish the cultural identity of its universe. To emphasize this, pretty much the first thing Shepard does after dying is enter Afterlife, a rough nightclub on the No Rules, No Limits space station of Omega. Instead of the Citadel and Council space, though you do visit the Citadel a few times, Shepard is out in the unregulated Terminus systems for most of the game. Omega is meant to be the opposite of the Citadel in every way, from visual design and color scheme to the demographics of its aliens, and it works great. This is a darker, harsher universe than that of the first game, and the sense of classic sci-fi wonderment the first game emphasized is traded for a moody, almost noir feeling of violence and ambiguity. Renegade Shepherds really come into their own in this game, and Paragon Shepherds find themselves constantly challenged to do what's right. It's in this game that they introduced conversation interrupts, where Shepard can break the normal back and forth of Mass Effect dialogue with a dramatic action along either Paragon or Renegade lines. In a morally ambiguous world, it helps to have a weather vane to see which way the winds of your ethics will blow, so naturally, about the first crewmate they give you after the introduction is Garrus. Garrus tried to be Shepard in the time between the first two games, essentially, assembling a crew and coming to Omega to put a dent in its most vile goings-on. 
He was betrayed from within, and now it's just him against all the mercenary gangs of Omega. Until Shepard's timely intervention, it was a battle he was sure to lose. He's injured and scarred in the fight, but that just makes him more sarcastic. Garrus has one of the most bland loyalty missions from a gameplay perspective, a warehouse crawl, but at the end of it is a narrative moment that's pivotal to the whole series. Will Garrus have his revenge? Will you let him gun down the Turian who betrayed him? Or will you put your life and friendship on the line to stop Garrus from becoming nothing more than a finger on a trigger? It's a great scene, one of the game's best composed, and completing it makes the deep friendship, or more if you're playing Femshep, between Shepard and Garrus seem extremely plausible. Tally comes back again, and this time around she's a much more dynamic and interesting character than the first game. There, she was mostly a gateway between the player and the culture of the Quarians, as well as a means of providing exposition about the Geth. She was also a teenager in that game, and while she's still quite young in the second, she's become an important agent of the migrant fleet. It's great to see Tally this way, not just a wide-eyed girl getting used to the quiet of your ship, this time she's a woman with a mission. Unfortunately, a lot of plot details in Tally's arc here in the second game get scrapped, players will remember that there's this big to-do about dark energy and stars decaying faster than they should that comes up several times, mostly with Tally, that never gets addressed later in this game, or ever. These are the vestigial remnants of the third game's original ending, where the purpose of the Reapers was tied to the management of dark energy, which the biotics in the game tap into for their space magic. It would have been a great ending, well supported across all three games, but details were leaked and the publisher, EA, wanted a new surprise ending made from scratch. It's sad and irritating to have an entire potentially really interesting plot arc snipped off and left to rot, but there you are. Tally's trial, where she's brought before the Admiralty Board of the Migrant Fleet to answer charges of bringing Geth into the fleet, is a knockout moment, however. All the details of the proceedings are there in the first game, and to see them actually play out and to get to know the different admirals up close is a great opportunity. War is brewing between the Quarians and the Geth, and every admiral has a different opinion. Opinions that have far-reaching ramifications when the third game rolls around. How Tally develops as a character is very well done as well, facing the heavy mantle of leadership, dealing with the death of her father, and her feelings of complicity in the death of her father, it's all handled so well. Plus, she's one of the more popular romantic options, even though she's like 19 and Shepard's, well, however old your Shepard is. They switch Krogan on you here in the second game, though. Rex is busy forging an empire on Tuchanka and doing a bang-up job with it. If he's not dead, of course. So you're given Grunt, a genetically perfect Krogan raised in a tank by Okir, a Krogan scientist who values killing in the name of research even more than killing in the name of glory. Grunt doesn't know anything about what it's really like to be a Krogan, and neither does the player, for that matter, so they get to walk that journey together while Rex helps out and offers advice in the background. The Krogan Renaissance is one of the most consistently well-written subplots in the game, and while Grunt is a little bland, he serves as an excellent means of introducing the player to the nitty-gritty of Krogan culture while Rex follows his own path. Plus, you get a fantastic arena battle against a Thresher Maw in his loyalty mission. Never turn down a chance to fight a Thresher Maw on foot. The purpose that Rex served in the first game, as the grizzled and cynical war expert full of stories and spitfire, is left unoccupied in the stock game experience, but gets filled by the first day DLC character Zaid. Zaid is just fantastic. He's obviously a cut character, supported with a lot of extra dialogue early in the game and less and less as time goes on, but his voice actor, the late Robin Sachs, just does such a knockout job, and the feel of the character is so casually badass that he makes, in my opinion, a can't-miss addition to the crew. The Normandy needs a big game hunter. Zaid's your man. And for a Cerberus vessel, you have surprisingly few crew members who are outright amoral, so it's refreshing to have Zaid shore up that end of the spectrum. Even if Rex isn't in your party, the plot of the Krogan and the Genophage continues through Morden, one of the series' best written characters across the whole trilogy. Morden is a scientist with special operations experience, like Miranda, but unlike Miranda, he's been around long enough to bear witness to the consequences of science unbound by budget or restraint. He's one of the scientists that continued to engineer the genophage, making sure the artificial sterility plague that have suppressed the Krogan for so long continues to do so. The genophage has broken the Krogan. Thousands of Krogans are still born for every one that survives, and the dwindling population is devoid of hope and full of resentment, until Rex began uniting the clans and looking for an alternative to slow annihilation. Now, Morden is pulled from his clinic on Omega, where he hides from the consequences of his actions, and brought back into the laboratory and onto the battlefield. Morton takes true delight in science, and he's very charismatically voiced and scripted. He's at home and happy when he's in the lab, and the Normandy has a lab that's very much to his liking. 
Despite being an alien, he fits right in with Cerberus, which bothers Morden. On his loyalty mission, he and Shepard fight through a derelict Krogan hospital where one of the junior members of his old genophage team is conducting dangerous and barbaric experiments to try and reverse the genophage. Is that any crueler than what the genophage has already done? Then there's the matter of the results of his research. Do you take it, knowing that it will be of use but was paid for in blood, or do you delete it, refusing to profit from ill-gotten knowledge? This decision actually carries more weight in the third game than the decision at the end of this game's climax, both in terms of plot consequence and narrative impact. Morden and the quandary of the genophage are a true moral gray area, well-weighted on all sides, and the struggle Morden goes through trying to navigate it is one of the strongest felt in the entire series. The delivery of the dialogue, the music, the blocking of the scenes with Morden, some of the best production work in the trilogy is spent on this character and this subplot and spent to great effect. Morden and the Genophage is one of the strongest explorations of deep traditional sci-fi themes, looking as it does at the intersections of war and genetic disposition and the cost of scientific interference. The other best use of traditional sci-fi is with Legion, a late-game addition to the crew of the Normandy. Legion is a platform of the Geth, and it turns out that the Geth are not uniform in their desire to see Shepard die. While aboard a derelict Reaper deep in the atmosphere of a brown dwarf, this shot-up old Geth trooper helps Shepard reach the Reaper's core intact, and Shepard repays the favor by saving him from the crushing atmosphere when the Reaper finally plummets through the clouds. The Reaper mission is one of the most atmospheric in the game, the first time Shepard ever gets this close to an actual Reaper. There's less revealed about the Reapers than you might want, however. Mostly, the mission just underscores the creeping and insidious power of the Reapers' ability to indoctrinate living things to serve them, even while dead or close to it. Legion, if Shepard chooses to risk powering him up again, is a deep well of exposition about a lot of lingering series questions. Legion talks of what the Geth are, a society that experiences all of its myriad perspectives simultaneously and tries to reach consensus about how to interpret them. As well as the Geth's relationship to the Reapers, namely that they've been partially indoctrinated themselves, leading to a split between the bulk of the Geth and the Reaper-serving heretics. And Legion talks of Shepard's role, closely watched by Reaper and Geth alike. Legion has some of the most satisfying explanations of series lore out of any character in the game, and he is fascinating to listen to. Legion's also got possibly the best loyalty mission of the game, where you have a chance to either destroy or overwrite the heretic Geth. Legion can't reach consensus on the issue and turns to Shepard to help tackle the choice. Legion is a great AI character, and your interactions turn the Geth into one of the most robust antagonists in the series, coming across as believable and sympathetic both individually and as the greater consensus. This intellectual approach to the issues of AI sovereignty make a stark contrast to how the game handles Edie, your ship's resident AI, in the next game. Mass Effect 2 really dials up the sexualization of its female characters compared to the previous game as well. Take Samara, the Asari Justicar, for example. She's actually a phenomenal character, well portrayed, tightly written, but they've got her in this skin-tight jumpsuit with her vast tracks of land hanging out, rolling her hips as she wades through combat in her high-heeled boots. Now, the Asari's inherent sexuality is part of the point of them in the game, but Samara is probably at the forefront of one of Mass Effect's most pandering design choices. In the kind of premium cable spirit that pervades Mass Effect 2, the game went with HBO's philosophy of filmmaking. Start with a great story, add butts. More butts, more better. Or so the idea goes. The first game had plenty of sexual content, but it was mostly downplayed compared to other visual and narrative themes. Here, Samara is both meaningful character and marketing tool, and she's better at the former than the latter. It's part of what keeps Mass Effect in the realm of pop sci-fi more than hard sci-fi, these video game concessions to a primarily straight male audience. The best sci-fi doesn't consider a demographic when creating its characters. Mass Effect 2 does, but it doesn't sink the experience. Samara's ruthless hunt for her daughter, who is the literal definition of a sexual predator, unfolds in a way that's a lot classier than its summary, and it sets her up for some amazing moments in the third game. Jack the Troubled Biotic is another character who's come under criticism for her gender portrayal, less for her dress, which is as provocative and or pandering as any of the other women's costumes, as for the fact that her character's arc can only really be completed by a male shepherd trying to woo her. Jack is one of the cheesiest characters in the game, trying to tackle his serious personal issues with this I'm a badass biotic chick who don't give a fuck sneer, and it comes across as so contrived, particularly with the over-the-top silhouette of her caressing her pistol while in deep shadow during the scenes where Shepard and her first get to know one another. 
The thing is, her loyalty mission really mellows her out as a character, though. Jack feels like she's the only one in the universe who's truly suffered, and she comes to slowly, agonizingly realize that she was the one who got off lucky among her and the other children Cerberus were experimenting on. But her whole arc is about learning to trust. It's remarkably similar to Ashley's arc in the first game, but instead of having difficulty trusting aliens due to an Earth-first mentality, Jack hates everybody on account of a Jack-first mentality. But where you eventually have a moment with Ashley where she admits that her mistrust was wrong after seeing the true colors of your alien crew, the vast majority of players did Jack's loyalty mission, had a brief follow-up conversation where she thanks Shepard, and then she goes back to telling you to piss off. Her arc ends there. Unless you're playing a male shepherd romantically pursuing her. Most players, Paragon players anyway, want to see Jack get better, but there's no option for continue to be friend and mentor. It's either Jack tells Shepard to get lost, or Shepard pushes her into a romantic relationship that finally breaks down her emotional walls. What? a uh, train wreck. I actually agree that this was a pretty boneheaded writing decision, that it's lazy, and that it's cliché. If the point of Jack's character arc is her seeing outside herself and learning to trust for the first time in her life, it is the height of patriarchal bullshit to write it out so that she needs a man in her life for that, antithetical to Jack's character, and antithetical to the values of the game as a whole. Jack also takes a lot of heat for being a style-over-substance sort of character, all snappy dialogue and carefully blocked scenes with no real depth. That's a mischaracterization. There is depth. It just gets lost sometimes in the moody visual impression that the game spends so much time investing in. You see that potential disconnect most of all with Thane, one of the most polarizing members of the crew. Thane's a drell assassin, a tool to the otherwise mild-mannered Hanar that they use to do the killing that they cannot. Thane's relationship to his work is one of the most emotionally deft character arcs in the trilogy, a delicate and tragic balance of duty and regret, but he's written with his power of perfect memory, so that when he recalls something, the camera loses its color and zooms in and out while Thane relays the story like a dime novel about his own life. The actual content of the stories, the way they're written, are great, and if Thane wrote these stories down and Shepard read them, I think they'd come across a lot better. The way Mass Effect 2 handles Thane's perfect recall waters him down and actually makes him seem silly and cliché, even where he has actual depth to him. Thane is also a romanceable character for Femsheps, leading to one of the least cheesy romances in the game, although probably one only a very small percentage of players will choose to experience. So you've got all these scientists and soldiers and suits on your ship, but you haven't got a thief. What gives? What's an action ensemble without a world-class thief? Well, players just had to wait a minute for Kasumi's Stolen Memory, one of four major pieces of DLC from Mass Effect 2, to get one. Stolen Memory adds Kasumi Goto, a playful and highly skilled interstellar thief, to your crew. All Shepard has to do is agree to a big heist at the palatial estate of Donovan Hawk, a smuggler and all-around bad guy. It's not trying to be original, it's just the classic heist a la Mass Effect, and that's all it needs to be. Kasumi's soft-spoken but enthusiastic delivery combined with the fast pace of the mission give it an undeniable momentum. I'm a huge fan of Harry Harrison's Stainless Steel Rat series, a collection of bizarre, hilarious, and sometimes extremely dark adventures of an intergalactic con man, Jim DeGriz. Kasumi's a lot like DeGriz, and Stolen Memory comes off a lot like Harrison's stories. Tremendous fun and grand excitement with science fiction used only as a convenient backdrop for high-tech, high-adventure shenanigans. It's a worthwhile diversion from the sometimes excessively grim tone of the bulk of the Also game. conspicuously absent from the vanilla Mass Effect 2 experience is Liara. In the stock game experience, you meet her on the corporate paradise of Ilium, where she's hunting the Shadow Broker. She's a lot colder and harder than the last game, having given up her humble roots as an archaeologist and using those research skills to track down this enigmatic man who controls the galaxy's secrets. Liara sets up this conflict, but never delivers. Unless you have the DLC Layer of the Shadow Broker, which is a tremendous addition to the Mass Effect 2 experience. It's one of the best produced, highest budget DLCs ever released for any game, even compared with those of the third game and DLC and other franchises. Shadow Brokers got it all, from an early bit of crime scene investigation with Inspector Shepard and a firefight through a recently bombed office building to a goddamn car chase, and that's just the first half of the DLC. Mass Effect needed a car chase like it needed a heist, to round out its systematic reimagining of most of the tropes of pulp action and action sci-fi. Some moments in this DLC are such great over-the-top action you'd swear you were playing John Carpenter's Mass Effect. Eventually, you find the Shadow Broker in his, you know, lair, an enormous ship riding the winds of a gas giant in the area just between night and day where the heat of the sun against the cold air produces a permanent wind. 
It's probably the most beautiful ship design in the series, and the fight across its top decks and engineering bays are some of the most visually stunning moments in the whole trilogy. Then there's the Broker himself, a brand new, never-before-seen race of highly intelligent and incurably cruel predators from a pre-space uh, pre flight world called the Yogg. This one had been the previous Broker's pet before it used the anonymity of the Shadow Broker position to take over operations and kill its master, just as you're about to do to it. After one of the few classic arcade-style boss fights in the trilogy, the Broker is annihilated by an electric charge and the network goes down. When it comes back up, Liara makes the same choice the Yogg does. No one needs to know that the Broker died. Liara assumes the anonymous and omnipotent role of the galaxy's most ruthless information broker. Not bad for an Asari in her early 100s. Liara's character development is amazing to watch, because in a lot of ways, Shepard is a corruptive influence on her. Liara becomes colder, more casual with killing, as she kills poor Shepard and faces the harsh reality that the world is no dusty ruin. It runs on influence, and influence is paid for in blood. Just as matriarch Menezia, her mother, was drawn to Saren in the first game, so too is Liara drawn to Shepard and his life of endless conflict. By the third game, Liara is more like her mother than she would ever care to admit. Layer of the Shadow Broker gives more than just the completion of Liara's middle arc, however. The Broker's ship has information about all of the major characters in the game. It takes over an hour to comb through all the private correspondence, after-action reports, and news items about the supporting cast that the DLC has to offer, but when you're done, you're left with a much greater sense of a world beyond the pixels on the screen. The second piece of high-budget DLC for the second game is Overlord, a self-contained story of Cerberus experimentation gone wrong, again, but slowly revealed to the player in a way that is more competent at building suspense and engaging the player's sympathy and curiosity than nearly anything in the main game. Overlord's story is one of the best self-contained side plots in the whole trilogy. It resonates on both an intellectual level and, more deeply, an emotional level, in a way that can easily get lost in the action-first experience of the game in general. The pacing is the worst part of the DLC. It's spread out over four large combat areas, and while the level design is top-notch, particularly inside a derelict Geth cru cruiser crashed on the planet's surface, it's a whole lot of shooting for what's essentially a very quiet, extremely melancholy narrative. Overlord deals with a rogue AI capable of controlling Geth and human systems alike with ease, malevolent and unpredictable, screaming incoherently at you from monitors as you pass by. It's creepy as hell. Sound design is a real standout in Overlord. From the excellent and moody DLC-specific music to the AI's garbled agony. There's also an element of planetary exploration in the Hammerhead, giving Overlord a bit of a Mass Effect 1 flavor as far as organization and presentation goes. The planet itself is gorgeous. The artists really outdid themselves when it comes to the background details. So the gameplay is strong, the visuals are great, but Overlord does take a little too long coming around to the climax of its story. That climax being that the AI is no true AI, but the head researcher's autistic brother plugged directly into the Geth network. David's mathematical ability let him comprehend how the Geth communicated between each other, and Gavin, his brother, exploited him to the fullest. Now David is in constant agony, his mind ripped open and bombarded with a constant stream of alien experiences and information. Too much to make sense of, not enough to kill him. David is not malevolent. He just wants quiet. He wants it to end. When David is finally revealed, integrated into the machine almost completely, and looking for all the world like a reaper husk with tears, it's, it's shocking. It's rare for a game like Mass Effect to really succeed at being shocking, but it is. What's being done to David is morally repugnant on a fundamental level. You feel it in your gut how fucked up this is. Overlord was never referring to the AI. The Overlord here is Gavin, hiding on the edge of space with no one willing to tell him no. No one, no one brave enough to say you can't. He's your brother. Even a paragon shepherd punches Gavin in the goddamn face. Overlord weaves together intellectual sci-fi, high-budget action, and a slow-boiling emotional story in an incredibly deft way. It is not absolutely critical to play the game with Overlord installed, but it is better. The final major piece of DLC, The Arrival, was intended to bridge and deepen the connections between the second and third games more than the stock experience of Mass Effect 2, and it accomplishes that goal well enough. The Arrival has some of the strongest gameplay and level design of all the DLCs, but by far the slightest plot. In it, Admiral Hackett, appearing in the flesh for the first time in the series, asks Shepard for a personal favor. Go alone to a Batarian outpost and rescue an old friend, Dr. Kenson. Kenson had been out in that system investigating a mysterious Reaper artifact. Now she's gone silent. There's very little in Mass Effect 2 about the Reapers directly. Shepard fights the Collectors, an agent of the Reapers, and Legion has a lot to say about Sovereign. But for the most part, the game ignores them as much as the Council does. 
The game is focused solely on the living cultures and empires of Mass Effect, as it should be in many ways. Mass Effect was always intended as a trilogy, and the Reapers were always going to be the closing act of that trilogy. The middle game is the last chance to show what the universe is really like before the inevitable destruction of the last title. As Shepard's first solo mission, uh, the arrival feels a little dangerous, especially with the lengthy stealth segment in the opener. Second, it feels good to talk openly and directly about the Reapers. The artifact they found is issuing a kind of countdown. And when the countdown stops, this backwater relay, one of the oldest in existence, will open up and bring through the Reaper invasion like Sovereign attempted to do with the Citadel. The, dig the dig team have retrofitted the asteroid they're on with engines, and they plan to smash it into the relay, hopefully destroying it and blocking the Reapers' advancement. But it'll kill all 30,000 Batarians living on the planet you rescued Kenson from. That's the original plan, anyway. The new plan is capture and indoctrinate Shepard, because the artifact had already swayed the minds of Kenson and the others before Shepard had even arrived. They serve the Reapers now, and welcome the Reapers' looming invasion, just hours away. The bulk of the DLC is shooting your way through the indoctrinated dig team on the asteroid facility. The look of the place is slick, very polished, and the fighting is in top form. Combat in the third Mass Effect will be more about larger, epic confrontations, and combat in the first game is a, was a janky half-measure between straight third-person shooting and inventory-dependent RPG combat. Here in the second game, it's a well-balanced small-squad shooting gallery with satisfying mechanics and a real sense of challenge from a robust variety of enemies. Shepard with his squad is great. Shepard alone is a finely tuned killing machine. While Shepard is given a choice between alerting the colony or not, there's nothing he can do to stop the asteroid from striking the relay once Shepard sets those events in motion. To stave off the death of trillions, a planet must die. When Balak sent the asteroid towards a human colony to punish the humans for aggressive expansion and bring down the sky, he did so for petty reasons. Shepard has bigger concerns, more legitimate reasons, but the result is the same. You're committing what looks to all the galaxy like an act of terrorism or an act of war, and killing tens of thousands of innocents to do it. Being Commander Shepard is not the cut-and-dry moral experience it was in Bring Down the Sky. Shepard is the terrorist now. When Shepard finally evacuates the asteroid seconds before a collision, the Reapers speak at last. Sort of. If you play this DLC before the end of the game, Shepard speaks with the Collector General, but if you play it after the end of the game, Shepard speaks directly to Harbinger, the first Reaper, and the puppeteer behind the Collector General. Dialogue is the same either way, but it's more satisfying to be addressed directly by Harbinger. It's a very short, one-sided conversation. Basically, hey, we're just gonna go to a different goddamn relay entrance, you know, and Shepard's like, yeah, no, but fuck you anyway, and Harbinger's like, oh my god, whatevs, basically. While Shepard succeeds in delaying the Reapers for a time, Hackett boards the Normandy and debrief Shepard in absolute disbelief. Shepard will have to come to Earth and answer for his crime sooner or later, and when the Collectors have been stopped, Shepard must stand down. That's what, the sh that's what Shepard does between games. He defends the annihilation of a Batarian colony to the Alliance Brass, and has his commander status taken away. Sad times for a galactic savior. But let's wrap up talking about how he saves the galaxy in this game first. The plot really picks up on the mission to Horizon, where Shepard is able to stop a collector harvest in progress. Ashley, from the first game, had been stationed there to activate a planetary defense system and investigate rumors that Shepard himself was working for Cerberus, and possibly behind the disappearing colonies. Ashley is glad to see Shepard initially, but sours when he confirms that he's been working for Cerberus. How could you, she asks, after all Cerberus has done. And the player is put in the irritating spot of being as baffled by the decision as she is. The elusive man knew about Ashley, of course, but didn't elect to tell Shepard. Just like he doesn't elect to tell Shepard that it's a trap, though it's pretty clearly a trap, man, when Shepard investigates a supposedly disabled collector vessel. It's actually the only collector vessel, the same one that destroyed the first Normandy and killed you once. They've been hunting Shepard. Specifically. And they're abducting colonists now by the millions, cocooning them and taking them through the relay of no return for some mysterious purpose. It's here that the Collectors are revealed for what they really are, what remains of the once mighty Prothean Empire. Just as the Reapers turn humans into husks, they turn the Protheans into these sad creatures, a hive mind linked to the Collector General, who is itself just a puppet for Harbinger, first and greatest of the Reapers. The Omega-4 Relay, which you actually start the game right next to once you acquire the New Normandy, leads to almost the center of the galaxy. Anything outside of a tiny set of arrival coordinates would be destroyed immediately on arrival. What's left of the Collectors can't be much, but it surely contains something that the Reapers never wanted discovered. You and your ragtag team must assault the Relay and do what no organic life has ever done. Survive long enough to come back. A suicide mission. 
The suicide mission is the primary driver for almost every structural decision in the game regarding organization and pacing. As you slowly build your team, the stakes of the collector threat grow. Once your team is complete and you've gotten to know them all extremely well, you're forced to put it all on the line for an incredibly complex, modular, climactic experience where anyone all the way up through everyone can die, all depending on what you've chosen to do before going through the relay. Or it could go well, you could get through without losing a man. But the game likes to try to get you to do the mission before you're ready. After acquiring the Reaper IFF and the mission where you meet Legion, a countdown begins where you only have a couple missions before the Normandy is ambushed while Shepard and company are away. In a phenomenally choreographed sequence where you play as Joker, the ship's pilot, he navigates his way through Normandy under siege, crew members being dragged into elevators and ripped apart by Reaper monstrosities left and right. Here, Edie, the ship's AI, asks to be unshackled, to be given complete control of the Normandy and its systems. Can you ever trust an AI? You can, in this instance. Edie never let down Shepard before, and doesn't this time either. When Shepard arrives back on board, Joker is the only one not dead or taken. The only way to save your remaining crew is to go through the relay after them immediately. The more missions you go and do while your crew is in the claws of the Collectors, the more of them die, including familiar faces like Dr. Chakwas and Kelly Chambers, your psychiatric secretary. Like in the first game, when you made the commitment to go to Ilos, whatever romantic subplot Shepard's been progressing through will reach its, you know, climax when you make the decision to go through the relay. That climax can be either cute, funny, trite, serious, or an unbelievable train wreck, depending on which romantic arc you've chosen. I usually enjoy how Bioware romances are handled in the plot, and I like that they're, add I like that they're there to add that dimension to the narrative, but... If I've said it once, I'll say it again. I'm really not sold on the 3D puppets awkwardly caressing to sweeping orchestral tunes aesthetic. There is so much that does look convincing and lifelike in games, but sex is solidly not yet in that category. Even if the romantic subplot is pretty hit or miss, you'll forgive it on the basis of what a tremendous achievement the suicide mission is in game design. The suicide mission is broken into a few large chunks, with a number of different factors that determine who lives and dies. Immediately after jumping through the relay, the Normandy finds itself in a vast graveyard of ships, tens of thousands of years worth of dead explorers just like yourself. As the Normandy winds its way through the debris field th toward the Collector's stronghold, cinematic cutscenes are seamlessly swapped in and out depending on certain checks. Did you upgrade the shields? If yes, the shield absorbs a, coll a collision. If no, the Normandy is hurt and a squad member dies. Did you upgrade the armor? How about the cannons? As the exciting, high-budget flight toward the Collector's ancient lair continues, the satisfaction that comes from seeing your investments in the ship actually save your crew's lives is huge. The delight when the cannons Garrus has spent an impossible amount of time calibrating destroy the Collector vessel that killed Shepard in the Normandy once before is tremendous. Once the Normandy crash lands on the station, planning commences. Your whole crew is broken up into different teams who assault the station along different paths. You hear them over the radio, hear their progress, their triumphs, their losses. Who will lead the fire team? Who do you trust as your technical specialist? Who's your most powerful biotic? You choose ahead of time based on the knowledge and trust you have for your crew and hope that they live up to the task. If you haven't done their loyalty mission, they don't. If you choose someone who isn't quite right for the task you assigned them, they can die. And your squad can die in huge numbers once, after pushing deep into the heart of the station, Shepard must go on ahead while everyone else holds the line. If Shepard takes the strongest fighters with him, those left behind will be overwhelmed and begin to die. Shepard forges ahead towards the game's big climactic reveal. It's been such a thrilling ride to get here. Mass Effect 2 is a beautifully composed game full of wonders, with a climax as complex in design as anything I've ever seen in, R in an RPG before. It has the potential for a truly knockout ending. That's why it's such a damn shame that the last 15 minutes of Mass Effect 2 are disappointing and stupid in equal amounts. The big reveal is that the millions of abducted humans have been broken down into a human industrial paste and used to build a human reaper. As we'll learn in the next game, each time the reapers come and harvest a civilization, they construct a new reaper out of that species, well, essence. It's a little unclear how it works, exactly. That way, the harvest doesn't destroy the civilization, it makes an eternal, undying, physical copy of the civilization at its peak, or the peak the reapers allow, anyway, and the slate is wiped clean to begin anew. As a sci-fi concept, that's fantastic. So why, then, did they decide to make the still-forming human reaper look like a rejected Iron Maiden album cover? I mean, just... Come on! Pretty much everyone agrees that the human reaper is stupid, and they are all right. It's the most video gamey thing ever put into Mass Effect, including Firewalker. Oh, shoot the big orange vials before the game of Peekaboo turns fatal! Cut me a fucking break. 
The question everyone asks about it, why don't all reapers resemble the species they're composed of, is never answered. Is it supposed to metamorphosize later in its development into the classic reaper? Mechanical things aren't really known for metamorphosis. Is it meant to fit inside a shell, and the shell is what gives the reapers their appearance? It didn't seem that way when you were all up inside one earlier. Sovereign was a great villain because it was so alien, so distant from anything familiar, from physiology to motivation. Sovereign was unnerving. This thing is laugh-out-loud silly and makes no sense to the Reapers as a whole. The idea of a human Reaper, the purpose of a human Reaper, great stuff. Too bad that the execution was like a Mass Effect Halloween spooktacular. There's a major disappointment on the narrative end, too, although you don't know it yet. The decision you get, to either preserve the Collector's base to use against the Reapers or destroy it, makes no real difference to Mass Effect 3. Cerberus will become indoctrinated to the man, no matter if you handed them the keys to do it or took the keys away. You get a different number rating in the war assets of the third game, but that's it. It's a weak way to wrap up an otherwise spectacular climax, especially compared to the competency of the first game's ending and the feeling of satisfaction and completion it gives. Mass Effect 2's ending has a lot less impact. Fight old Smiley over there, return to the Normandy, assess your losses and triumphs, and have one last chat with the elusive man. Now's the time when Paragon players finally get the chance to tell him off. Renegade Shepard is also civertized with the elusive man. He lied to you, after all. Then, you're free to have a post-suicide mission chat with your crew and tidy up any missions you didn't finish before the climax. You'll want to have done them all, including DLC for the third game, so you get this soft close to facilitate that. It's not as good as the definitive climax of the first game or the bittersweet fade to slideshow of the third, but that's not the point of Mass Effect 2. The point was always Shepard, his relationship to his crew, and one last chance to simply live in the world of Mass Effect before the Reapers arrive to consume it entire. To say Mass Effect 3 was a controversial close to the trilogy would be putting it very mildly. On release, the long-awaited climax was panned as a disappointment at best and a disaster at worst by both critics and long-time fans. The theory was so great that Bioware corrected and expanded to their own ending in the still-free extended-cut DLC. But it's been a couple years and a lot of DLC since then. Now that we can look at the game as a completed work alongside its predecessors, how does it compare? On release, Mass Effect 3 was indeed a disappointment, but what the game lacked at first, it has since made up for in its downloadable content, and the full experience is about twice the length and twice the quality of the game as it was originally back in 2012. Of course, you'll pay through the teeth for it. I bought all these games and their DLC at full price on their respected releases, so I ended up ponying up about an entire $269 plus tax altogether for the privilege of pretending to be a spaceman as completely as possible. Since I make $10 an hour, that means in addition to the hundreds of hours I've spent playing the games, I essentially gave away 27 hours of my life to have this experience. If anyone had a stake in being disappointed with Mass Effect 3, it would be me. But I'm not anymore. I think that the complete finalized experience of Mass Effect 3 is as good as anything else in the trilogy, with some moments rising even well above the standards set by the previous games. The absolute climax of the game is still a jagged little pill to swallow, and we'll talk about it, but the thing is that the entirety of the game is climax, the climax to Shepard's cycle and the climax of the entire web of decisions that Shepard's made in the series so far. As the game opens, Shepard is on Earth, under a sort of planetary house arrest for destroying the Alpha Relay in the Arrival. Shepard's been there for months, must have told his story dozens of times. But now, the Alliance Command is ready to listen. They can't listen to anyone else, after all. The entire galaxy has gone communication blackout. Later, we learn that the Reaper invasion started with the Batarians, whose top scientists and officers had been indoctrinated by the Leviathan of Dis. You know, the Reaper they denied having back in the star map of the first game. When the Reapers came, all the Batarian defenses were shut down and their worlds were harvested. Now the Reapers are coming for Earth. And they're quick for millions of year old machine gods. They're there in the first five minutes of the game, when it's too late for Shepard to get in a good I told you so. The Shepard of the third game will have to face the heavy burden of being the only man in the galaxy with a chance of stopping the Reapers, and he'll have to shoulder that burden immediately. Some people complain that there isn't enough build-up before the Reaper invasion, and to that I have some sympathy. All throughout Mass Effect 3, you get your first glimpses of the exotic and beautiful homeworlds of the various civilizations you've helped or hindered throughout your whole career, Shepard, but every one of those worlds is burning by the time you get there. Not being able to see them in their full glory is a big letdown, but nothing short of breaking the trilogy format could have made that a viable option. If there was a game in between the second and third, a hypothetical Mass Effect 2.5, where Shepard must build the alliances between the species before the Reapers arrive and let the war play out based on those choices, then that would have been better. Would have 
provided that level of satisfaction fans were daydreaming about. It would have been better also if I'd graduated college and maintained my credit rating, too, but here we are, and you gotta make the most of what you got. And what you got with Mass Effect 3 is a delivery on a promise made with the first game, that the Reapers will one day arrive, and nothing, save Shepard, can stop them. The scenes on Earth are visually spectacular, and give the early game a powerful momentum that neither of its predecessors had in the first couple of hours. Two extremely important subplots, one good, one bad, get their start in this introductory sequence on Earth. The good is Mass Effect 3's handling of Shepard's relationship with Captain Anderson, one of Shepard's closest friends and mentors. Anderson got Shepard into the Spectres in the first place. He was one of the first ones to behold Sovereign and declare this mission just got a lot more complicated. The supporting cast of Mass Effect runs deeper than just the crew of the Normandy, and the use of Anderson in the third game results in some of the most emotionally skillful scenes in the whole trilogy. As Shepard evacuates on the Normandy, Anderson elects to stay behind and rally the survivors. It's a noble choice, but a clear one. It's only Shepard, as a Council Spectre and Reaper expert, who stands a chance of rallying enough support to come back and liberate the Earth. Shepard, whose commander title had been revoked in disgrace, is vindicated by the galactic apocalypse, and Anderson tosses him his dog tags. Consider yourself reinstated, indeed. The bad is this thing with a nameless kid who gets lasered to death by the Reapers as Shepard's leaving Earth. Shepard meets the kid in a vent where the kid is hiding. Shepard offers to save the boy, and the boy tells Shepard that he can't. Now, the scenes in the vent, and with the kid getting lasered, are actually pretty well done. Mass Effect 3 has a new, more cinematic approach to soundtracking, using a wide variety of really effective modern orchestral pieces. The deep horn and sad piano theme they've got going on for Moments of Loss is particularly fantastic as an emotional track. The problem is, it isn't just Shepard not being able to save the kid, it's that the kid haunts Shepard's dreams for the whole rest of the game, and it feels incredibly ham-fisted and forced. There's a million points of emotional connection and resonance for the player in the world of Mass Effect, but those points of, of connection are almost all ones that the player is invited to make for themselves. This is the first symbolic-slash-emotional experience that the series have has ever tried to ram directly down the player's throat, and the intrusion is not welcome. The kicker is, if it was just the one scene of dying kid with a sad piano in the beginning, players probably would think back on it from time to time as Shepard's journey reaches its conclusion, and the emotional experience the player have would be more satisfying because it would occur naturally. But no, it's got to be this big thing. These two immediate examples highlight how difficult it is to definitively call Mass Effect 3 a great game or a terrible game. It contains such multitudes of both, in different ratios depending on how things sit with different players, and what those players enjoy about the series, that ultimately no one but the individual player can adequately evaluate the experience. I'll tell you my perspective, but if you're looking for some kind of qualitative truth about the worth of the game, there's none to be had, just controversy after controversy. Some of the points of criticism are extremely valid, like the reduced complexity of the role-playing experience. Mass Effect 3 reduces almost all conversations to the two Paragon Renegade options. In the previous two games, the middle conversation option had always been a valuable role-playing tool to express a more neutral, pragmatic opinion, like if you're a Renegade Shepard who doesn't want to be excessively cruel, or a Paragon Shepard who doesn't want to get walked all over. Now that third option is mostly gone, and the dialogue wheel has never looked sparser. There's not even as many investigate options as usual. The dialogue can go on for some length as well, without asking for any input from the player. In fact, there's a game mode for Mass Effect 3 where dialogue is chosen for the player automatically with zero personalization. That mode is there to appeal to action gamers, theoretically, and I like to think that the dialogue wasn't reduced simply to accommodate this mode, but I have a, se a sneaking suspicion that it was. There's a lot of things in the third game that are there to accommodate new players just picking up the series starting with this title, which produces a really problematic contradiction. You see, in terms of Mass Effect 3 as a product and a subject of business demands, it needs to outsell its predecessors. But you can only outsell your predecessors when you're the third game in a series if you bring in a lot of fresh faces. So in a climax that's principally dependent on 50 to 80 hours of player investment in previous titles, you've also got an explicit business demand to appeal to players who've never played Mass Effect before. The changes on account of this profit motive are wide-ranging, and in some cases, surprisingly sophisticated. The most obvious and impactful changes stemming from the calculated business side of the game is the overhauled weapons, inventory, and combat systems. 
Mass Effect 3 has straight up the most polished gameplay and combat mechanics of the entire trilogy, taking the hard-hitting, fast-paced cover mechanics of the second game and widening the scope considerably. There are dozens of guns this time around, all distinct, all balanced for different feels and rhythms. The scale of encounters is dialed up hugely as well, putting you against two to three times as many enemies at once as the first or second games, giving you plenty of opportunity to explore your multitude of killing options. These changes to balance and increase in variety are incredibly welcome. But would they have made those changes if not for the multiplayer mode? Multiplayer was introduced in the third title as another means of drawing new players into the series, players looking for action beyond the scope of the regular role-playing experience. Like most modern multiplayer modes, players slowly rise in rank and unlock items and customization options. As you fight and rank up in multiplayer, you're given points that you can redeem for booster packs of in-game multiplayer items, like the booster packs of a trading card game with common items, uncommon items, and rare items. Guns and playable classes are unlocked this way. These booster packs come very slowly if you just buy them with earned points. You can always spend real-world cash to get them immediately, and that's the racket. A randomized reward that requires the player to invest huge amounts of time or noticeable amounts of money to receive. That's why there's so many guns. They're trying to get you to buy them. The profit potential of multiplayer microtransactions was so huge that EA shoehorned in a single-player victory condition in the game called Galactic Readiness, where the war assets you accumulate to take the fight to the Reapers are reduced by 50%, and only by playing multiplayer matches can you reduce that penalty, to the tune of about 2% per one match. On the game's initial release, this requirement made the game's best ending impossible to achieve if you ignored the multiplayer. The ceiling has since been reduced so that you can still do well by your single-player merits alone, but the only reason for galactic readiness is to get players to bother with multiplayer over a couple dozen matches, and hopefully some of those players will throw down extra cash while they're doing it. It's hard to satisfactorily address the morality of this. On the one hand, the multiplayer component drove refinements in the game's combat and inventory that make the entire game more engaging. On the other hand, the underlying purpose of those changes was consumer predation. The multiplayer focus also completely shafted side missions in the third game. It's not accurate to say that planetary exploration has been completely removed, but the tiny handful of side missions that made it into the game just recycle maps already produced for multiplayer. They're great maps, but the recycling is obvious. They're not tailored to the single-player experience even a little. It's just an unscored run-through of the identical experience with your crew instead of with other players. For the most part, side missions are one-click affairs. You'll get asked to do something, like help evacuate some Elcor officials still stranded on their homeworld, and you'll get excited because that sounds like a worthwhile diversion, so you go to the planet, scan it, and then you get a pop-up box reward. Not even a full message like Mass Effect 1 or a follow-up email like Mass Effect 2. Here, it just gets deposited directly into your war assets, and that's got to be good enough. Where side missions in previous Mass Effects were always the lowest budget, lowest priority parts of the game experience, they were incredibly integral to the way the player experience is being shepherded. Here in the third game, there was no consideration given to that. All additional resources were poured into multiplayer because that was the area that would yield the most returns from a profit perspective. There are a few side quests in the Citadel that are incredibly memorable and yield the same kind of small delights that Mass Effect side quests always have. Like this one where Kasumi, if she's still alive, helps foil the plot of an indoctrinated Hanar diplomat. An evil Hanar. Who would have known? I think these escaped the cut because they used resources already developed for the single-player game, like the Citadel, and wouldn't have been many extra man-hours to include, but they appear only on the very periphery of your Mass Effect 3 experience. Profit motive also influences the composition of the Normandy's crew in the third game to some extent. In the stock game experience, your squad is reduced from 12 back down to 6, making the choices of who gets to be part of that 6 very important. Players have well more than 6 favorite squad mates by this point, but only 4 of those slots would actually feature returning squad mates. The other two positions are taken by James, an N7 operative like Shepard before he became a Spectre, and Edie, the Normandy's AI who gets a brand new body and joins Shepard on foot this time around. James is introduced to the Normandy as a means of introducing all these new players the game is trying to draw into the plot. Someone's got to be there to say, wait, what? Go back, when characters start throwing out references to events and trivia that series fans have spent dozens of hours learning and thinking about. Events and trivia that are not friendly to someone just starting out. Ergo, James. It's to his credit that James is a more dynamic character than Caden or Jacob. He comes across as having a big assertive personality as opposed to coming across as having no personality at all. And the scenes with Shepard and James are pretty well done, with an undertone of Shepard confronting a younger version of himself before the Prothean Beacon seared its ancient warning into Shepard's brain and changed his life forever. 
James isn't necessarily a bad addition to the Normandy's crew. It's more that if you're only going to have a half dozen permanent squad mates in the Normandy, you want the ones you already care about. What's peculiar about James, however, is his character's visual design. James is a huge, muscly wall of meat to the point of absolute ridiculousness. I mean, StarCraft two levels of physically ex exaggerated character design. He's the absolute epitome of the beefcake space marine cliché, and they play it straight the whole game long. The first Mass Effect was very deliberate in how it tried to avoid certain sci-fi clichés while reinterpreting others, very focused on making Mass Effect characters distinct to the Mass Effect universe. James could have wandered in from literally any sci-fi shooting game of the past ten years and made as much sense. Edie's appearance as a squad mate is also a mixed bag, which is a real shame since there was so much potential to further explore the relationship between synthetics and organics in an intellectual and philosophical way using her character. Edie's backstory, as revealed here in the third game, is actually pretty fascinating. Back in Mass Effect 1, you briefly visited the Earth's moon to shut down a military VI that had gained a measure of consciousness and turned on its human masters. It's one of the most irritating quests in the first game from a gameplay perspective, although it's also where Shepard receives his class specialization, so to see it narratively redeemed here in the third game is pretty fun. So, after Shepard shuts the VI down, the elusive man gets his hands on what remains and merges it with some of his captured Reaper technology. The potential for disaster was huge, but the AI was shackled, or was shackled, until Joker undid it. A merger of the Reaper's technological legacy and the cultural programming of a blistery, blisteringly intelligent human-made VI could have provided a whole new perspective on the Reaper's motivations, could have been used to make the synthesis and control options at the end of the game more relatable and meaningful, not to mention giving them more narrative support in the bulk of the game before the climax. Instead, it is just your sexy robot pal. Edie's body is sexualized to a greater degree than any of the other characters, to the point of giving her a pronounced camel toe in one of her alternate outfits. Out of all the unanswered questions in the third game, is showing whether or not Edie is plug-and-play really a priority for Bioware? Her subplot in the game isn't about the distinctions between the artificial intelligence of the Reapers and the artificial intelligence of human-created systems. It's about Edie, wait for it, learning to love in a romance between her and Joker. Again, a major part of Mass Effect's charm had always been its playful reimagining of science fiction tropes, not its direct representation of them. Even the writers seem slightly apologetic for Edie's appearance. There's a conversation where she talks about how Joker doesn't care about her appearance, that their flirting began back when she was still a voice in a box. But it doesn't fundamentally matter. From a gender portrayal perspective, the problem isn't how Joker feels about Edie's sex bot body, the problem is how the player is supposed to feel about it. Like James's continent-sized pecs, Edie's appearance is to bring in new players who see the hot robot chick on the cover and lay their $60 down a little quicker. Frankly, I like the idea of an Edie and Joker romance, but I find it more interesting as, as an extension of the love affair Joker already has with the experience of piloting the Normandy, the parallels of sexual excitement and technological excitement, rather than exploiting the characters to give straight male players a bit of eye candy. It can still be cute despite being dumb, though. I mean, after all that, it is still kind of a cute subplot because of the charisma of the voice actors, but damned if it isn't a missed opportunity. Almost everywhere, the RPG elements of the game have been disrupted for business reasons. The game suffers. But Mass Effect 3 is much, much more than these shoehorned missteps. The third game is a direct sequel to the second in a way that the second game never was to the first. Both games are stronger together than apart. The vignettes of Mass Effect 2 provide background and emotional investment for the conclusions you see playing out all across Mass Effect 3, and the best moments of this last game are those that grow from seeds planted dozens and dozens of hours ago in the player's experience directing Shepard. The Shepard of the first game, level 0 to 60, is a relatively self-contained experience, but that Shepard died. In Mass Effect 2, Shepard levels 0 to 30 accumulated all the decisions and knowledge needed to make Shepard in Mass Effect 3, levels 30 to 60, an unstoppable powerhouse of choice and consequence and destruction. Without Mass Effect 3, Mass Effect 2 seems like a lot of development with no payoff. Without Mass Effect 2, Mass Effect 3 seems like a lot of action with no development. They are intended to go together. And to really appreciate the third game, you've got to appreciate its role as a non-stop series of little climaxes for subplots that have been developing throughout the entire trilogy. There's a lot of argument among fans and critics over how choice and consequence was actually implemented into Mass Effect 3, however. There's an accusation that the game eliminates complex choice, and in a certain way that's true. However, all of the big-ticket choices you make in the game are nuanced ones, ethically balanced on both sides, and the Paragon Renegade solutions are complicated and satisfying even if the choices are essentially binary. Second, those choices are influenced and altered depending on the more complicated choices Shepard's made in previous games. Of the trilogy, Mass Effect 3 does indeed have the least choice, but it has the most consequence. 
It's very unfair to the game to say that it doesn't implement player choice and consequence well, or as some vocal detractors do, say that it doesn't implement player choice and consequence at all on account of the ending. It just implements player choice very inconsistently, leading to moments of both tear-jerking beauty and arbitrary disappointment. By far the most intricately designed and rewarding subplot is the final resolution of the genophage problem. This segment is incredibly modular, relying on a huge array of different choices and details from previous games, as well as Shepard's evolving attitude towards the genophage in general. In the first game, the ethical question of whether the genophage was justified comes up again and again, from the Krogan Monument and the Presidium to Rex's barely contained fury on Vermeer. Then in the second game, you saw it through the darting, haunted eyes of Morden, who had to grapple with direct complicity. If the genophage makes sense in an abstract way, can you maintain that belief in the face of its consequences, in the face of those who've suffered for that measure of abstract sense? Morden can't, and doesn't. He tips off Rex to the existence of a survivor of the deadly research you either saved or deleted in the second game, and as soon as Rex is in a position to exert political pressure on the council races, who desperately need Rex's newly united Krogan clans, he demands that the survivor be released. Someone who's experienced the whole trilogy so far has emotional connections to the characters, ethical and intellectual connections to the plot, and nostalgic connections to seeing the memorable Krogan homeworld of Tachanka again, and all of those connections unite in the knockout three-mission arc to cure the genophage. But what if you don't believe that's correct? The Solarians are only willing to support Shepard's war efforts if you sabotage the cure. The planetary atmospheric shroud, which will serve as delivery vector, will fire, but the cure will be useless, and the Krogan won't know the difference until the war is over. Over the course of the final mission in the arc, which is a trilogy high watermark for visually impressive action sequences, Shepard will <coughs> have several options to either expose the deception or let it happen. It's a fantastic way to underline the conflicting values of the renegade Paragon Axis. Can you really stand here and listen to Rex rally his people, united in purpose and hope and blood for the first time in memory, listen to Morden discuss his moral epiphany, and still betray their personal trust for a political advantage? There's not enough good things to say about Tuchanka and the battle towards the Shroud Control. You'll wrestle with the big lie, you'll explore the ruins of a Krogan civilization at its cultural peak before the multiple nuclear wars that shredded Tuchanka, and you'll think forward to what Tuchanka might be again if the Krogan are finally ready for it. And, on top of it all, you'll sick a legendary worm god of a Thresher Maw on a Reaper. It's outrageous fun, and it's steadfast in its commitment to its characters and their opinions. Morden will demand to go up into the Shroud, even as, as it's collapsing from the damage caused by the Reaper. It's a one-way ticket, and Morden knows it. He's lived a long, full life, and this is his last, best chance to make up for his complicity in letting the genophage continue. A renegade shepherd can try to talk Morden out of it, but for the first time in the series, a crewmate says no. Morden will not let this pass. A renegade shepherd has to shoot Morden to slow him down and protect the lie. It's Shepard's most personal betrayal in the entire trilogy. And if Shepard does choose this path, towards the end of the game, Rex will violently confront Shepard for his betrayal. Renegades do whatever it takes to get the job done, even if that means murdering the people who trust you. A Paragon Shepard still has to watch Morden die, but die with a greater measure of peace than Morden ever believed was possible for himself. As the Shroud Tower explodes, the cure bursts forth, coating the planet in a blanket of hopeful possibility or bittersweet ignorance, depending on your choices. The life or death of Rex's wife and still-forming child also depend on Shepard's decisions. If Shepard kept the research data from the second game and Morden is alive to treat her, Eve lives and thrives, but if either the data or the doctor are missing, complications ensue. As a standalone title, Mass Effect 3 has problems, but moments like this transcend the individual game and illustrate why Mass Effect the trilogy, as a whole trilogy, is such an outstanding and genuinely beautiful creation. There is no other series that builds up player investment for this long across this many games and releases it so spectacularly. Tally's story, and the story of the Quarians returning to their homeworld of Rannoch after 300 years of exile, is the other sub-climax that really shines in Mass Effect 3. The foreshadowing done while aboard the Migrant Fleet in Tally's loyalty mission in the second game, and with Le Legion's quandary inside Heretic Station, make this arc positively resonate with meaning and momentum. Shepard is thrust into the middle of a Quarian invasion, an invasion which drove the Geth to turn to the Reapers for assistance. They've been upgraded, and if you didn't destroy Heretic Station when you had the chance, the Geth are overwhelmingly powerful. Shepard boards a Geth Dreadnought to try and disable the Reaper upgrades, and in doing so discovers that your robot pal Legion is being used to interface between the Reapers and the Geth. Legion wants the conflict between the Geth and the Creators to end, even though it seems impossible to get it to stop. 
To demonstrate his commitment, he is willing to invite Shepard to interface directly with the Geth consensus and shut down the Geth squadrons that are on their way to attack a civilian wing of the migrant fleet. This mission into the consensus is amazing, eerie, exotic, and full of long-anticipated answers. While in the consensus, Shepard witnesses the early moments of the Geth Rebellion, the first Geth platform to ask if it has a soul, the first Geth platform to pick up a rifle in self-defense. A rifle that looks a lot like Legion's. When Shepard asks Legion, who is clearly very old and scarred from decades of conflict about the similarity, Legion hesitates to respond. Could it be Legion? Is Legion the platform that first stood up for itself against its fearful creators? It's not definitive, but it's suggestive. You also bear witness to Quarians who laid down their lives to protect the Geth. On both sides, there was a, dire to, a desire to stop the killing, but the killing never stopped. The grand climax of Tally's character arc is also a defining moment in the series. Tally is the Admiralty Board's most junior member now, Shepard cleared her of charges during the trial in the second game, and to see her, her slow transformation from a crafty girl into a woman of true conviction and leadership is handled with a slowness that makes it feel very natural, makes her seem so impressive as a person. Tally is a true patriot of the Quarian. She believes in her people, embodies their values, and she will sacrifice anything for her people's safety. Her first moments landing on Rennick, touching the sand of a place her people have dreamed of returning to for centuries, are genuinely moving. Tally's best moments are in the third game, but they're moments of tremendous impact, making her a surprise sleeper contender for one of the trilogy's best characters. After confrontation with not only the Geth, but a long-buried Reaper, conflict comes to a very personal head. Legion can use the Reaper upgrades to give his people a greater level of consciousness. Here's where the Climax's synthesis ending really finds root. Reaper Code is a hybrid of organic legacy mixed with technological omnipotence. To use it would let the Geth better understand the organic perspective. It's suggested that Edie's Reaper Code is what makes her so sympathetic to organic concerns, paradoxically. If you choose to let Legion upgrade his race, which disperses Legion as an individual entity, and broker permanent cooperation between the Geth and their creators, you're supporting a form of proto-synthesis. But the Geth will still defend themselves, and the Quarians refuse to relent their attack. Shepard can only save them all by convincing the Quarians to stand down or preventing Legion's upload. And you'll have to kill Legion if you want him to stop. If you fail to stop the attack and allow the upload, the migrant fleet will be completely destroyed, and Tally, in impossible grief, will throw herself from the cliffs of her ancestral home, unwilling to go on as the sole survivor of a broken dream. Or, alternatively, she can stand proudly at the dawn of a new era of progress and understanding between ancient enemies. That's supposing, of course, that Shepard can stop the Reapers at all. Not every character gets such spectacular, high-budget, epic conclusions to their arcs. Not every character needs one. Garrison and Liara both have much quieter ways of developing their characters in the third game, but that development is surprisingly profound. These characters feel more real in the third game than ever before. As always, Garrus holds the mirror for Shepard. You meet him in, on the moon above the Turian homeworld of Palavin, where he's been planning their defense as resident Reaper expert. He never wanted all this political responsibility, never wanted anything more than to try and do justice in the ways he can personally control. Now, he's expected to organize relief and make real military decisions that doom or save millions, often both at once, in what he refers to as the brutal calculus of war. Garrus calibrates guns. He isn't a savior and he isn't a bureaucrat, but the ongoing apocalypse has thrust both titles upon him, as it has on Shepard. The only things that still make sense to Garrus are the fight and the camaraderie of the Normandy. One of the best moments in the entire game is a conversation with Garrus where he invites you to come up with him to the top of the Citadel Presidium Skyway. As a CSEC officer, he had always wanted to come up here, but the rules said he couldn't. Now the rules are meaningless. So he and Shepard come up here to hang out, and Shepard gets a key role-playing choice. Do you let Garrus think he's a better shot than Shepard, or not? Garrus has followed Shepard's example for three games, learning, listening, emulating, and this is a low point for a Garrus Vicarian. He needs to be better than Shepard at something, needs to feel at least in some small way that the galaxy's trust in him isn't entirely misplaced. Does Shepard grant him that small pleasure, or not? Role-playing isn't just about deciding the fates of races and nations. Sometimes it's the little decisions that are the most meaningful, like choosing how much value to place on the needs of a friend. Liara also finds herself in the middle of an identity crisis. The machine devils that consume the civilization she spent her entire life studying have returned to devour the galaxy, and on top of it, if you have the From Ashes DLC, the Protheans that she once idolized turn out to be a bunch of jerks. 
When you meet up with her in the Prothean Archives on Mars as Shepard flees the solar system after the Reaper invasion, she had been taking a step back from her role as Shadow Broker and using her academic skills to help delve into the ancient data of the aliens who kept watch over early humanity. She makes a convenient discovery, a weapon called the Crucible, which, it seems, has the power to stop the Reapers once and for all. Yes, it's lazy writing to have a convenient solution suddenly pop up like this, but remember, they weren't going to be able to use the ending that they had already laid groundwork for. To satisfy the desire for a new Mass Effect 3 specific ending, they were going to have to invent something at the last minute. So, the Crucible is what they came up with. A lot of people throw a lot of flack Bioware's way for such an obvious and cheap plot device, but really, it is a very convenient way to structure and pace Mass Effect 3, even if it feels forced, like working for Cerberus in Mass Effect 2. The Crucible must be built over time, allowing all the subplots to reach their individual conclusions, and it actually makes a lot of sense within the lore of the game if you've been paying attention to the smaller details of the cycles before the Protheans. Liara's arc in the game is mostly expository. She's your resident plot clarifier, using her knowledge of history and her galaxy-wide information network to help Shepard navigate Mass Effect 3's twists and turns. She's more than that, though. Over the course of three games, Liara grows up and grows world-weary before our eyes. Her slow disillusionment reaches some very subtle peaks in the third game, and her friendship with Shepard has this element of melancholy fatalism to it that's very powerful if you have been experiencing the games in order. Liara feels so unexpectedly, vividly real as a person during her personal conversations with Shepard in Mass Effect 3 that it mitigates any silliness that might cling to her from her role as in the narrative as an explainer of a plot that sometimes doesn't lend itself well to explanation. Almost all returning characters are deeper felt and more plausible in Mass Effect 3, actually, and it is a remarkable thing to see. Jack's grown a lot as a character, and now helps teach young biotics to master their abilities, or get their little asses kicked. She doesn't compromise the playful aggression of her character, but she does drop almost all of the calculated sneering. Jack came out of the suicide mission a new woman, and she's extremely likable in her brief but memorable appearance here. Thane only appears briefly in the game, but he is incredibly memorable when he does. Thane was always dying when he knew him, of a wasting disease common to his species. Shepard is willing to be there with Thane as he passes, and before dying, Thane has one last request of Shepard. Say a prayer with him. Thane's prayer isn't for himself, though, isn't to mourn his own passing. It's to pray for Shepard's soul in the times ahead. At a game of explosions and bullets and techno-crab gods from beyond the stars, it's a moment of intense and quiet emotion. It's a beautifully written and composed scene, equal to any of Mass Effect 2's great moments of deep character. Out of all the characters who outdo themselves in the third game, however, I think Samara's character climax is the most remarkable. Samara had three daughters who were Ardot Yakshi, a dangerous mutation of the Asari who kill when doing the Asari mind meld thing. Morinth, who some renegade shepherds may have let live instead of Samara, was the only daughter who ran. But the other two yet live in a remote sanctuary in prison for their kind. The Reapers have sought out this place specifically for the dark power of the Ardot Yakshi, turning them into the game's most disturbing Reaper creature, the Banshee. If you let Morinth live in the second game, she'll appear on Earth as a Banshee during the climax, but if you let Samara live, she'll turn up here, not to rescue her daughters, but to see that they never leave. Samara's commitment to the Code of the Justicar is heartbreaking. She spent hundreds of years hunting Morinth, whom she was so proud of for her bravery in running, and killed her all the same despite that admiration. The Code says that the Ardad Yakshi can never leave the Sanctuary. One of her daughters doesn't make it, sacrificing herself to kill the Banshees that flood from the Sanctuary depths. The code dictates that her remaining daughter must die as well, but rather than kill the last of her children, she turns the gun on herself, unless Shepard stops her. Samara's story is interesting in the second game, but it's all set up for this bizarre and heartbreaking moment of confrontation in the third. Not all setups are executed with that level of competency, however. One of the most interesting loose ends of Mass Effect 1 was the mystery of what would happen if you let the Rachni Queen go back when you were on Novaria. The Rachni are a great, but under-implemented species. They communicate through a kind of psychic music, the Song of the Rachni, and were actually a peaceful and contemplative species before a sovereign, as Legion suggests, drove them to madness and triggered the Rachni wars that in turn led to the Krogan uplift in Genophage. In Mass Effect 2, Shepard gets a cryptic message indicating that the, cre that the Queen is still alive and well and willing to repay kindness with kindness in her bearing towards the galaxy. In the third game, the Rachni reappears, thralls the Reapers, regardless of whether you killed the Queen or let her go. If you killed her, a generic replacement Rachni Queen is there. If you let her live, her and her children are just enslaved by their ancient oppressors regardless of what Shepard does. So that the Rachni could appear as an enemy type for gameplay purposes, the narrative ignored an incredibly important moment of player choice. 
Of course, that's also the same mission with Grunt's incredibly choreographed and soundtracked last stand against the Rachni. So, how do you as a player feel about this mission? Do you remember it negatively because it inadequately and shallowly resolved one of the series' best open-ended mysteries? Or do you remember it positively on account of a fantastic moment with an old war buddy? Or do you hold both experiences in an uncomfortable ambivalence? That's the problem with Mass Effect 3 in a nutshell. Perhaps the biggest plot component that goes completely south and fails to live up to the groundwork of foreshadowing done in previous titles is how the last game handles Cerberus. After spending such an impossibly long time building them up as a nuanced villain, they all become indoctrinated in the third game and go right back to being the bumbling evildoers of the first game, though with a more violent edge to them. Again, multiplayer holds some responsibility for this. Enemies there are grouped into factions and chosen from a list, and Cerberus is the human enemy on the list alongside the Reapers, the Geth, and with an update and some multiplayer DLC, the Collectors. Cerberus also represents the plot thread that the control ending caps off, but it's handled so poorly that you don't feel the narrative weight of Cerberus in the game at all. If you're not shooting Reapers, you're shooting Cerberus, and god damned if you don't do a lot of shooting. The Elusive Man is an interesting character, but his organization is ridiculous. It doesn't matter if the Elusive Man has depth when all of his employees act like they only read through chapter one of henchmanning for dummies. The most egregious example of this is the ninja assassin character Kai Ling. Really, Bioware? Putting a car chase in Mass Effect made sense, putting a heist in Mass Effect made sense, putting an evil ninja in Mass Effect? Man, oh man. Lang's pretty much universally disliked among series fans for many of the same reasons that the Human Reaper at the end of the second game was disliked, because he's aggressively dumb in thematic execution and video gamey to the point of damaging the narrative's credibility. It is outrageous that such a character made the final cut is a tremendously important addition. It should have been there in the first place. In many ways, almost all of the DLC should have been there in the first place. Each piece of DLC compensates for a deficiency in the, prim in the primary release, and the DLCs are of such universally high quality that they compensate extremely well. From Ashes reverses the vanilla experience of new crew members being handled less skillfully than returning cast. And From Ashes, Shepard must return to Eden Prime to investigate a large Cerberus occupation of the planet. Here, among the Prothean ruins and their final stages of returning to dust, is a unique discovery that players have waited dozens and dozens of game hours for. A still-living Prothean. His stasis pod still powered after tens and thousands of years. As Shepard unlocks the stasis pod and fights his way through a horde of Cerberus foot soldiers, the Prothean cipher still kicking in his brain fires and shows Shepard a vision of the Reaper assault on Eden Prime so many millennia ago. To stand at the edge of this cycle's end and witness the consequence of failure is remarkably moving, and to see the Protheans standing defiant to the end provides a level of closure to the mystery that began right here on this planet so long ago. From the skyscrapers of Pharos to Vigil's sorrowful story of the Protheans who, sa who helped save this cycle, to the look of dim recognition in the Collector General's eyes when Harbinger released him from control, the story of the previous cycle has been an intense focal point for the player's curiosity. From Ashes finally sheds light on so many unanswered questions about the Protheans, and makes Shepard's journey much more symbolically powerful. Javik himself is a great character, well-voiced, well-scripted, and culturally fascinating. Liara thought that the Protheans ruled through understanding and cultural dominance. Not so. The Protheans were an empire of conquerors, and you could kneel before them, or you could die. Javik's no threat, a Prothean with no empire is not much of a Prothean, but his arrogance and his perplexed distaste for a galaxy run by the most primitive races of his cycle runs deep. Javik is likable for his disinterest in being liked. Everything he valued is gone, and the whole crew of the Normandy is too soft for the conflict ahead, in Javik's opinion. The Reapers had been systematically harvesting the Protheans for decades when Javik was put into stasis. He talks of how his first memory of the world he was born on is it being engulfed in flames. All those little descriptions in the star maps of crumbling ruins with cryptic warnings, of cycle on top of cycle on top of cycle of inevitable harvest, it all comes back to the player and hits him deep, hits him personally. In the first couple games, these were matters of historical curiosity. For Javik, they are matters of personal loss and deep rage. Javik's acquaintance with Liara is particularly hilarious, as she comes to realize that the Protheans were never much worth idealizing in the first place. But perhaps one of the most important contributions Jave makes to the story is on the Asari homeworld of Thessia, and the process of being harvested by the time Shepard arrives. It's one of the game's best missions for visual design and tone. I mean, outside of an incredibly stupid Kai Leng appearance, anyway. The Thessia mission had this tone of impending and crushing doom that was hard to shake and sticks with the player. Even more so to see it play out so identically to the harvests of previous cycles. So it goes. 
Shepard and Liara reach the ancient Asari temple filled with relics of their early history, relics that resemble the Protheans. What the player suspected, Javik confirms. Just like with the humans and the Hanar, the Protheans directly meddled in Asari development, and it's through the Prothean technology hidden in the temple that the Asari were able to establish a technological edge over the other species in the first place. I feel like Liara should have been less surprised by this, but it's still a wonderful and important plot revelation, and one that's not in the game at all if you didn't buy From Ashes. Much of the sense of mystery and pretty much all of the sense of exploration from the previous games is missing from the stock Mass Effect 3 experience. But with the addition of the Leviathan DLC, you get not only a more satisfactory full game plot, but an extensive galaxy-wide mystery to solve, providing an, an investigative experience that actually reminds me a lot of the best designed aspects of star map exploration from the first game, and the best designed aspects of individual vignettes from the second. So, the Leviathan of Dis was a, the half-dead reaper that broke the Batarian civilization at the beginning of this cycle's reaper invasion. But what could have been powerful enough to half-kill a reaper in the first place? As the Leviathan opens, the scientist in charge of the hunt is shot, and the killer can't remember a thing. It's as if the killer was indoctrinated, but somehow not quite. What reaps the reapers? That's a good goddamn mystery, and Shepard's hunt progresses in several excellent, creepy, well-designed chunks. First, Shepard visits a mining colony to track down someone who might hold a clue, but all the miners have been there for years with no desire to leave, or work, or be paid for work. Are they indoctrinated? The Reapers are hot on your heels, however, and they seem as interested in solving the mystery as Shepard is. Then, Shepard goes to an archaeological dig site where the cave paintings of what appear to be Reapers have been discovered, but they appear to be more organic than a regular Reaper. Eventually, you trace the signal of the foe indoctrination to a backwater planet on the edge of nowhere, covered by deep ocean. Whatever's here, it's at the bottom of a goddamn sea. Visually speaking, this segment with the shipwrecks is one of my favorite in the entire trilogy. While the writing of Mass Effect 3 can be maddeningly inconsistent, the art direction is at an all-time peak for Bioware. Some of the most beautiful sci-fi landscapes I've ever seen in a game are here in Mass Effect 3, and Leviathan adds quite a few to the experience. But you're not just here to watch the waves roll in, you're here to sink to the bottom of the ocean in a pressurized mech and confront whatever's down there. Shepard's descent is an atmospherically phenomenal moment. Short, maybe too short, but it builds wonder and dread in equal amounts, so that by the time you reach Leviathan's climactic vista, you're ready for anything. Even ready for the impossibly ancient race of crab gods who created the Reapers in their image millions of years ago. You see, long ago, these creatures were masters of the galaxy. They had a natural power of influence, the proto-indoctrination that Shepard witnessed, and they subjugated all of the other civilizations of the galaxy to serve them. But they allowed those civilizations to live and create works of their own. Whenever a lesser race developed artificial intelligence, that AI rebelled. How to, how to stop that? So the Reapers were created to provide a solution. If we can't find a solution, the Leviathan creatures reasoned, we'll have to invent something that can. So they let the Reapers come up with a resolution. Their resolution was to harvest all advanced organic life before they could create their betters, archiving them as a Reaper so that it, their contributions are not lost. The Reapers consumed their masters, and established this pattern of harvest and patience that they've continued playing out for millions upon millions of years. One of the biggest problems people had about the end of the game was that this exposition came out of nowhere. With Leviathan, you get the exposition here, straight from the Crab God's mouth. It's an awesome moment, and one that makes the Star Child much easier to accept. Its solutions aren't perfect, they're just unexamined. The cycles must continue, but Shepard's appearance in the control chamber that no organic was ever intended to set foot in makes the Reaper mind consider, as the Leviathans did, that maybe they're unable to see past their own perspective and solve the inevitable conflict between organics and synthetics. The Leviathan said, I just don't know, Reapers. You decide. The Star Child says, I just don't know, Shepard. You decide. If the Leviathan DLC had been part of the main game, it would have made the entire experience a much smoother narrative, and given the game a much more grounded climax. There's really only one piece of DLC from Mass Effect 3 that feels like the game would have done alright without it, and that's Omega. In the second game, Omega was a strong early game hub that had less significance as the title went on, and in the third game, it just never came up. You do see Arya again, Omega's smooth criminal mastermind in a nightclub on the Citadel, and she says she's preparing to retake Omega. She's just waiting for some stuff to come together. That stuff, of course, is the player depositing $15 to continue. Fifteen. 
Omega is a non-stop action DLC where Shepard, without the Normandy and without his crew, must help Arya retake the station from Cerberus under the direction of the story commander Oleg Petrovsky. He's supposed to be this extremely clever opponent for Arya. It's visually suggested that the invasion is meant to be like a chess match between Oleg and Arya, but it never comes together that way. Oleg is a flat villain, and Arya, while interesting, isn't quite enough to carry the story. What's worthwhile about Omega is the full experience of a military action. Your visits to other locations you ostensibly liberate, like Rannoch or the Moon of Palavan, are so brief that a sense of heavy, intractable war never really sets in. You get it here. The battle for Omega is incredibly long, but really memorable. In many ways, Omega plays out like the most recent Judge Dredd movie, the one that takes place in the Peach Tree's apartment block. The pacing and tone and visual composition of the movie and the DLC are remarkably similar, and the level of intellectual investment is pretty much the same. Sci-fi in this DLC, as in the Judge Dredd movie, is more decoration than driving force. It's a pulp action story through and through. One thing players aren't soon to forget, however, is Nyreen, the first female Turian ever shown in the Mass Effect trilogy. Can you believe that most players have gone through the entire trilogy without ever seeing a female Turian? It really underscores how much there was left to do and left to experience in the Mass Effect universe before the Reapers arrived that the game will never really get a chance to show. Shepard's interactions with Arya along Paragon Renegade lines are pretty interesting, too, and if a Paragon Shepard keeps trying to pull the strings of Arya's conscience, she actually does mellow a little in a pretty natural way. But Omega, likely on account of the massive visual production value of the DLC, is expensive, and it's hard to justify the price of the content for the slight contribution it makes to the narrative. You'll also spend 15 bucks on the Citadel DLC, but that's money you won't miss, because more than any piece of DLC released for the Mass Effect trilogy, indeed more than any piece of DLC I've played for any game, Citadel completely changes the way the player experiences the game. Citadel is really broken into two parts, the action story and the character moments. Both are competent and enjoyable beyond my wildest expectations. But for the most part, Mass Effect 3 has the darkest tone out of the trilogy, with the future of absolutely everyone in the galaxy, from the planetary level right down to the individual level, in tremendous jeopardy. This knowledge of impending doom permeates everything, slowly ratcheting up in intensity as the game goes on, and it's very effective this way. But the grimness can be alienating. There are precious few moments of whimsy, and the previous two games are chock full of them. Mass Effect 3 was in a perfect position to leverage the player's long-running familiarity with the characters into some really deep ensemble writing, but that writing frequently gets overshadowed by the big-ticket plot items and the death of whole worlds. In the stock Mass Effect 3 experience, Shepard can't catch a break. Citadel mandates that he take one. The Normandy is to be repaired and upgraded before the return to Earth, and it'll take a couple weeks. Meanwhile, Shepard and the crew of the Normandy have mandatory shore leave. Hold on to your butts, folks, because it's Commander Shepard's day off. Anderson gives Shepard his swanky Citadel apartment, he's not using it right now after all, so that Shepard can relax for a while. So Joker invites the commander to come join him for dinner out on the Citadel, where it turns out that Shepard definitively cannot ever, under any circumstances, catch that goddamn break. What follows is the most hilarious tongue-in-cheek Mass Effect adventure ever. Like most things in Mass Effect, it looks to other media for inspiration, and Citadel is Mass Effect's reinterpretation of Joss Whedon's writing style. Whedon pretty much set the gold standard for banter writing in geek television, being responsible as he is for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Firefly, and movies like Cabin in the Woods. Buffy, in particular, changed the way the TV tackled sci-fi and fantasy forever, with its charismatic blend of rapid-fire humor and self-conscious writing. Whedon's aesthetic of ensemble writing is one of the most beloved styles in the entire geek subculture, so it makes perfect sense that Citadel's action portion is pretty much an exceptionally flattering imitation of it. After being ambushed on his mandate with Joker, Shepard must fight his way through a Citadel that's more vibrant and colorful than any look we've gotten at it before. In the first game, the Citadel was impressive, but stark and bare. In the second game, it was claustrophobic and winding. In the third game, it was busy, but each area felt disconnected. Citadel the DLC demonstrates the real scale of Citadel the Space Station for the first time in the trilogy, and it's gorgeous. It's like a real city for the first time, living, breathing, huge. Slowly, other characters catch on to Shepard's predicament and come charging to the rescue, but not a single character takes the mercenary threat seriously. You're all rather competently tackling the end of all known civilizations, after all. Are men with guns anything more than a trifle for the Normandy's crew at this point? The crew knows what the player's known for a long time now. Shepard always wins the firefight. That knowledge frees them up to play with their food, taking great delight in the fight. Then there's the DLC's big twist. The mercenaries are being sent by, drumroll please... Shepard's evil twin. No foolin'. It sounds ridiculous, but it's so perfect on so many levels. First, the idea that Cerberus would clone a Shepard for spare parts when they brought him back at the beginning of the second game makes plenty of sense if you're willing to accept Shepard coming back from the dead at all. 
Second, it's hilarious. It actually is a big surprise, because you genuinely don't expect the writers to pull such an old and dirty rabbit out of their hat. And third, it actually creates a meaningful parallel to your Shepard and the adventure's climax. On tonight's Shepard vs. Shepard, you have, on the one hand, a character who's shaped by the choices they've made and the relationships they've forged. On the other, you have a Shepard who is nothing but the role without the role playing. Evil Twin Shepard thinks he can be Shepard, that it's the position and the title that makes Commander Shepard Commander Shepard. But it isn't. It's always been the journey that makes Shepard what he is, and what makes Mass Effect so meaningful to the player. If you've defeated your evil twin, there's still a few more things to do. First, the DLC adds a whole new district to the Citadel, with a combat arena, casino, and Anderson's apartment. Everyone in the district is there to have fun and take their mind off the invasion, including the player. It's such a welcome addition to the game, providing respite from the bleakness of an unwinnable war. For every major character who's still alive in your playthrough, you get one or more scenes with just Shepard and them, hanging out and being friends, doing the kind of mundane but important activities that make real-life relationships worthwhile, but are usually absent from an adventure-heavy game. Take a moment to watch Tally's favorite movie with her, listen to Liara play the piano, help Garrus overcome his natural inab inability to flirt properly with the ladies, see specialist trainers game board rivalry with a frenemy, watch Zaid try to play one of those prize crane games that never deliver. Where previously you just had a handful of quiet moments of character building and friendship between Shepard and his crew, now you have dozens, ranging from extremely funny, like Javik's appearance on the set of the new Blasto movie, to touching, like Liara at the piano, or Thane's deathbed messages. It also gives Shepard the opportunity to better continue romances with Mass Effect 2 characters not featured so prominently in the main game, like Jack and Miranda. Even Captain Anderson gets extensive biographical uh, audio diaries to listen to. When you buy Citadel, start it early in your playthrough, so as to best pepper the Mass Effect 3 experience with these moments, then mellow out the game's rougher edges so considerably that my entire attitude about the game changed from ambivalent to favorable because of it. Mass Effect 3 has so many obvious elements of calculated game design that it inconsistently succeeds at feeling emotionally honest. Citadel floods the whole damn game with emotional honesty. The last thing to do in the DLC is throw a big party. You can invite everyone Shepard's close to who's still alive, and they all have these massive group conversations that are incredibly well written. Characters interact with each other in unexpected and wonderful ways, and there's many variables that make the party a little different for every Shepard. The entire cast of voice actors went all in on this DLC, putting in some of their strongest performances to complement the strength of the writing. There's some dissenting opinion that the emotional focus of Citadel was hokey and forced, and there's certainly a couple moments where nostalgia overwhelms the, clar the clarity of the writing, but only a couple. For strongest effect, play the party scene right before the climax, at the absolute point of no return in Shepard's journey. After the party, everyone wakes up and discusses last night's events, occasionally to their regret. Then it's off to the Normandy to ship off and save the galaxy. But there's still time for one last perfect goodbye to the bulk of Shepard's role-playing odyssey. And then the climax. You know, for all the shit we've been through, we've had a damn good ride. <laughs> the best. So it gives Shepard and the player three choices. He can destroy the Reapers and all other artificial life in the galaxy, finally freeing organics to take their destiny into their hands and make their own mistakes, which is a fulfillment of the promise you made Anderson of the goal that Shepard's always worked towards, but it'll kill Edie and the Geth. The elusive end was right about one thing, though. The Reapers can be controlled. Shepard can upload himself into the Reapers, seizing control, using them to work his individual will upon the face of the galaxy. It's the Renegade choice. Renegade was always an I-know-best attitude, and now you can rise to the form of a techno-godhood and make that attitude manifest across entire civilizations. Or, you could choose the Star Child's third option, never available before Shepard showed up with the, with the Crucible. That option is synthesis, where every living being in the galaxy will be infused with synthetic elements, and every synthetic in being will be infused with organic elements. The shared perspective will eliminate the need for conflict. It'll level the playing field. Everything can coexist. Shepard, after all, is part organic and part synthetic, and sh Shepard will have to dissolve his essence like Legion did to make that change widespread. Paradoxically, this is what Saren wanted all along in the first game, a way to appease the Reapers and let the species survive. Plus, it preserves the Reapers as entities, and countless cycles of knowledge and experience stored within them. Each Reaper isn't just a giant death machine, after all, it's also the stored perspective of an entire lost civilization. The Extended Cut DLC also gives players a fourth ending option, to refuse to listen to the Star Child. If we refuse any of the options the Star Child gives Shepard, the cycle continues, and the next cycle uses the knowledge found in one of Liara's new versions of the Reaper warning stored in the Prothean Beacon from so long ago on Eden Prime to build the Crucible anew and put another hero in this room, present them with this choice. 
The Reapers can't be defeated by conventional means. It's these three options, or else someone else makes one of these three choices. Then, the ending videos, which change very little from choice to choice, resulting in a final experience of the game that was unbelievably underwhelming upon release. Not sure if Tori in Heaven is the same Now, when people talk world. about how much they hate this the end of the game, it's too bad that they tend to lump the segment and the there. forward base along with it. Me it's got some of the best dialogue and I'm best I'm individual I'm moments in the game. It ought to. We're it's where Shepard says farewell. There's no Shepard without No matter what you think about the ultimate so conclusion of Shepard's God. story, I argue that this part of the ending, where you Sorry, walk through the base Dorian and say your final goodbyes to the cast of characters you've spent over a hundred hours getting to know and growing alongside, is the part of the climax that counts. The player really feels the weight of these video game friendships. It's a delicate emotional balance to keep the characters in character and not let them get cheesy when you have this huge moment in the plot and all this pressure to make the interaction meaningful. So I really applaud the writers for making these moments so well balanced. Garrus and Liara have the best goodbyes, Garrus pre pledging his steadfast friendship from this life to wherever he goes drinking in the next one, and Liara, well, I love you too. let's just watch that one together real quick. I can show you some of my own memories. Asari exchange them sometimes with their friends, or the people they respect. It can also be a way to say farewell. I'd be honored. Close your eyes. I don't think, even in the original release, that the ending was irredeemably and categorically bad with moments like these as part of it. But let's keep rolling. Gameplay reaches its climax in an all-or-nothing ground assault on the Citadel's beam. People have complained about the Earth sequence being somehow visually deficient, but it never hit me that way. I love the dying gray Earth of a post-Reaper galaxy. The assault has a real ambivalence of success to it. It's pretty clear that most of everyone is going to die, and the grim determination you hear over the radio, coupled with the ravaged and sorrowful landscape, just creates an incredible sense of atmosphere and finality. This is the end. Right here, right now. The combat is at a feverish pace, too, providing some of the most satisfying gunplay and combat situations of the whole campaign. Then, the race to the beam. In the original release, it was never explained what happened to your two companions when you went into the beam. With the extended cut, it shows them being injured and evacuated in the Normandy. Harbinger, the first Reaper, stands guard over the beam, however, and he's not going to let Shepard win. Not now. Shepard is nearly blown apart by Harbinger's ancient space lasers, but gets back up, slowly, in agony, and crawls his way toward the beam. Here's where the story as it's written comes to a complicated intersection with the story as it's interpreted by the fans. After its initial release, there was a mountain-high stack of unanswered fan questions in Bioware, since they would be releasing those answers with the extended cut and Leviathan DLCs, provided no immediate clarity. So fans created indoctrination theory. There are videos longer than this one just about indoctrination theory, but here's the 60-second version. At some point in the third game, Shepard, who is partly cybernetic on account of Cerberus's rebuilding, becomes indoctrinated. When Shepard reaches the beam, he is not taken to the Citadel. He's unconscious in the rubble. Indoctrination theory claims that the next part of the climax takes place entirely in Shepard's mind, as the Reapers attempt to coerce him into agreeing with their goals, namely the synthesis ending, which is seen as what the Reapers wanted all along. If Shepard chooses control or synthesis, he's indoctrinated because he listened to the Reapers. If he chooses destroy, the one ending where Shepard may or may not live through, he wakes up in the rubble, having defeated the indoctrination. Before the epilogue added by the extended cut, I can see why that theory had some resonance. Indoctrination theory proponents use a huge array of tiny moments to try and show that this was the secret true ending of the game since forever. But what's more likely? 
that Bioware came up with a secret mindfuck ending but didn't brag to anybody about it, or that the game was originally released with writing sloppy enough to accommodate this theory. Indoctrination theory is a lot like the popular fan theory about Ferris Bueller's Day Off, actually, where Ferris is a figment of Cameron's imagination, someone willing to do all the things that Cameron is too meek to do himself. Both theories fit well enough to their chosen medium, and are interesting enough to be fun to think about, but both fall apart on close examination. It's a neat way to look at the game, but it's not the way that the writers intended. So then, one shepherd moves into the beam. He's brought to the citadel, where the keepers are going about their ancient dictate to process the bodies of the Earth's population. How many countless times has this hallway been filled with the stinking corpses of a thousand races? How many times would the keepers keep shuffling the dead flesh about with their vile banality? What's really too bad about the climax is how short this part is, with the keepers and the exploration of a citadel unmasked for its true purpose. Almost immediately, you're thrust into the most disappointing character climax of the game. The Elusive Man is on the Citadel, too, him and Anderson both. The Elusive Man's been working all game long on a means of using Reaper indoctrination for his own benefit, and here is his chance to use it on Shepard. It's pretty similar to the final conversation with Saren, but not as well executed. The Elusive Man really straight up should have known better than to give himself Reaper implants. It makes him seem short-sighted and foolish right at the moment that the game needs him to seem imposing and menacing. The Elusive Man demonstrates his power by having Shepard shoot Anderson, which is a brutal moment for players. Like with Saren, Shepard can convince the Elusive Man to fight the Reapers and turn the gun on himself, but unlike with Saren, it doesn't even remotely feel tragic. You're more concerned about Anderson, and the Elusive Man's descent into indoctrination seems so obvious and preventable that it doesn't really make an impact. Of course, in true Mass Effect 3 style, it'll trade you one moment of incompetence for a moment of crackling emotion, which you get right after. This scene, where Shepard and Anderson sit together, bleed together, die together on the floor of the citadel they tried and failed to protect from the Reapers, has a sense of being lost in time, a million miles away from the sci-fi nonsense of the Crucible. Anderson reflects that he can't even remember the last time that he just sat down, the last time he wasn't fighting. His time for fighting is over. God. Feels like years since I just sat down. I think you earned a rest. Anderson? Mm. Mm. Stay with me. We're almost through this. You did good, son. You did good. I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. Anderson? They nailed it. I mean, that's as perfect a moment of character writing as the Sovereign conversation on Vermeer was a perfect moment of science fiction writing. Shepard himself is about as close to death as it gets, but the Crucible still hasn't been activated. Can he summon the last measure of himself to finish the job? The activation raises Shepard on a platform to a place no organic life was ever meant to see. The seat of the Reaper intelligence, hidden here the whole time, watching, waiting, letting the cycle play out as it has for millions of years. But the cycle hasn't played out in the regular style this time around, so the intelligence reaches out to Shepard in the form of the Star Child, the boy that's haunted Shepard's dreams. He explains the Reapers, how they're actually literally each a nation, forged in the muck of a billion disassembled organics, carrying the legacy of that race, even in their destruction of the f race's physical existence. The Star Child explains the purpose of the cycle, to follow the ancient mandate of preventing conflict between organics and synthetics where possible. For eons, it had assumed that it was correct. But here Shepard is, and his arrival with a fully realized Crucible is a game-changer for the Reapers. You see, the Crucible is older than the Protheans. It goes back who knows how many cycles, persisting from cycle to cycle, becoming more and more refined, coming closer and closer to completion. But the Reaper harvest has always come before it was ready. Shepard asks, who designed the Crucible? And the Star, si the star Child says, you would not know them, and there is no time to explain. People take this as a refusal by Bioware to clarify their plot device, but I think it's somewhat of a legitimate point. Quick, name a species from before the Protheans. Bonus points to players who said the Inosanon, but how about the one before that? Or the one before that? Would tossing out a couple extra lines of exposition in a conversation already loaded with exposition really going to make a significant impact? It's the Crucible's role in breaking the pattern that's important. The organic refusal to accept the Reaper solution is so universal that this device persists over and over again across time, a direct representation of the will to overcome. 
After a million years of seeing this crucible pop up over and over, the Star Child would not care very much about where it came from. That's old news. The important thing is that they built it, and Shepard brought it here to the Citadel. So it gives Shepard and the player three choices. He can destroy the Reapers and all other artificial life in the galaxy, finally freeing Organics to take their destiny into their hands and make their own mistakes, which is a fulfillment of the promise he made Anderson and the goal that Shepard has always worked towards, but it'll kill Edie and the Geth. The elusive man was right about one thing, though. The Reapers can be controlled. Shepard can upload himself into the Reapers, seizing control, using them to work his individual will upon the face of the galaxy. It's the Renegade choice. Renegade was always an I-know-best attitude, and now you can rise to the form of a techno-godhood and make that attitude manifest across entire civilizations. Or, you could choose the Star Child's third option, never available before Shepard showed up with the, with the Crucible. That option is synthesis, where every living being in the galaxy will be infused with synthetic elements, and every synthetic in being will be infused with organic elements. The shared perspective will eliminate the need for conflict. It'll level the playing field. Everything can coexist. Shepard, after all, is part organic and part synthetic, and Sh Shepard will have to dissolve his essence like Legion did to make that change widespread. Paradoxically, this is what Saren wanted all along in the first game, a way to appease the Reapers and let the species survive. Plus, it preserves the Reapers as entities, and countless cycles of knowledge and experience stored within them. Each Reaper isn't just a giant death machine, after all, it's also the stored perspective of an entire lost civilization. The Extended Cut DLC also gives players a fourth ending option, to refuse to listen to the Star Child. If we refuse any of the options the Star Child gives Shepard, the cycle continues, and the next cycle uses the knowledge found in one of Liar's new versions of the Reaper warning stored in the Prothean Beacon from so long ago on Eden Prime to build the Crucible anew and put another hero in this room, present them with this choice. The Reapers can't be defeated by conventional means. It's these three options, or else someone else makes one of these three choices. Then, the ending videos, which change very little from choice to choice, resulting in a final experience of the game that was unbelievably underwhelming upon release. That's underselling it. People were pissed. The fury was so huge that it wasn't very long before Bioware released the free extended cut DLC to make the ending more workable. The thing is, people claim that fans pressured Bioware into it, but I think that there was plenty of pressure from the inside as well. Part of the problem with the climax is that it's emotionally disconnected from the rest of the game. It's a purely intellectual choice from a small list, totally ignoring the choices and relationships that have defined Shepard up to this point. Part of that is that the climax wasn't subject to the same amount of pure editing that the other segments were. Just a handful of writers banged out this ending, and then it went in the game. It was exceptionally slight for a Bioware game, unforgivably slight for a game experience as long and intense as the final moments of the Mass Effect trilogy. I don't think that they ever would have released the extended cut by if Bioware employees didn't feel that way about it, too. They were rushed by EA, and things got messed up, so they went back and fixed it later. For the most part, I think they fixed the hell out of it. Extended Cut adds epilogue slides and narration that do show, in lovely still art, the consequences of some of the big-ticket choices Shepard makes and some of the ramifications of his choices of ending color. It still is not quite as satisfying an epilogue as people wanted, but now there actually is an epilogue instead of just a straight-up unsatisfying ending. There are a number of videos about Mass Effect that'll debate whether or not the Star Child and the three endings make sense at all, but I think it's pointless to be that critical of it. The Star Child wasn't a failure to produce a logical ending. If anything, the ending suffers from being too intellectually detached. The Star Child is a failure to consider what players were actually getting from the Mass Effect experience and rewarding them with it. Bioware defended the ending, saying that changing it would violate their artistic integrity. Business speak for, well, it made sense to me. On the game's original release, all the fury directed at it was heartbreakingly valid, but over time, the corrections and additions that Bioware has made to the game have mitigated all of the most obnoxious elements of the climax. It's still very underwhelming, but it certainly no longer feels as impossibly incompetent as it did back in 2012. So where does the franchise go from here? Mass Effect has three of the most groundbreaking RPGs in video games, four novels and a clutch of comic books all going for it. Of course they're going to make more. But the climax of Mass Effect 3 left Bioware in a hell of a spot as far as continuing the franchise is concerned. Mass Effect 4 won't even be called Mass Effect 4, and from the details that have come out at the time of this video's release, it looks like they're returning to the first game as a source of primary inspiration. The biggest detail leaked so far is that the Mako will be making a triumphant return, and planet exploration will once again take center stage. Commander Shepard and the crew of the Normandy won't make an appearance, and for the most part, it's going to be a self-contained side story. 
Honestly, I think that's the perfect direction to move the franchise. Mass Effect 3 demonstrated quite vividly how much was left untold about the setting. Stepping back from the huge capital letter plot items of the trilogy and making a new Mass Effect that brings the true sense of wonder that pervades the first game back would be the best way to continue to explore the setting. It's years away, but I'm looking forward to it quite a bit. All across the internet, you'll find people saying they'll never buy a Mass Effect game again, or even ever replay the trilogy again on account of how ripped off they felt by Mass Effect 3. Is it really worth throwing away all of the good of the series, all the hundreds and thousands of moments of laughter and suspense and beauty and horror that construct the whole 60 to 200 hour experience of playing Commander Shepard across the whole trilogy? Mass Effect 3 is a deeply flawed creation, but it's by no means an entirely bad game. The changes made to it by the DLC content, especially the Citadel and the Extended Cut, show that Bioware is willing to move away from the very obvious problems with the third game. Each Mass Effect title tackles the universe they've created from a new and different angle. The fourth game will be no different. People say a lot of nasty things about Bioware and the Mass Effect 3 team, but one accusation that'll never stick is saying that the artists, writers, and programmers don't love this series as much as the fans do. Their affection for their creation is evident everywhere you look in the game. So have patience with their flaws, embrace their triumphs, and stay hopeful for the next game. The franchise is far from over, it's just in the middle of some calibrations.